Sorry. Hello and welcome back to the returning from the executive session for school committee. Please stand at the pleasure. I thought it was a and to the public, which is stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. I would like to remind everyone to be recorded. If any member of the public would like to make an audio or video recording of this meeting, please notify me by raising your hand in person or remote, and I will notify the public for the Massachusetts public meeting launch. Is there anyone naming our recording? Okay. And I will check online. Members of the public are welcome to speak about items that are not on the agenda. Comments should be limited to two minutes in length. Due to open meeting law, there will be no debate or action taken on public items. For, agenda, for items on the agenda, the chair may accept comments from the public following the committee's discussion of an item. Additional comments and feedback can also be submitted by email to schoolcommittee at falmouth.k12.ma.us. Is there anyone who would like to make a public comment? Please come forward and tell us your name for the record. My name is Ann Hinman. And can I ask respectfully that I read, I've timed myself twice, but I go a little over two minutes. So I was just hoping that I could read my full statement. How oh, long is a little older? It's like, like 15 seconds. I'm okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. Thank you. Sure. You want to sit next to this? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's me. I attended the family forum last Wednesday at North Donald Elementary to listen to family questions and concerns about ongoing topics such as screen time, mastery based learning, and gender identity being taught in our school. I wanted to speak to give more clarity on my position and beliefs regarding public comments made at our last school committee meeting. Following those comments, I had a very nice meeting with Lori Durr, Rebecca Vieira, Sue Augusta, and my husband Greg, where we had a respectful, informative, and open discussion, specifically but not limited to the teaching of gender identity in our schools, and more importantly, in our elementary grades. I express that we as a family do not feel school is the place where discussions like this should take place. School should be a place where our children learn academics, play, make friends, and are taught to be kind and accepting to everyone, embracing each other's differences. From talking to many families and teachers in Falmouth, if parents were truly aware of what was going on in our schools, more and more people will continue to pull their children out. The family forum ended up being a room packed with teachers and FPS staff. A small group of parents were mingled in through roughly 35 to 45 people. Throughout the night, there were many times where I was absolutely appalled at the way that parents were spoken to. People laughed, whispered, rolled eyes, made faces, and openly embarrassed parents who took the courage to speak up. The principal of one of our elementary schools was incredibly disrespectful to a parent, I think even bringing her to tears at one point. A parent in the room mocked the Catholic religion, and the room erupted in laughter, as if believing in God and being deep in your faith is somehow laughable. Then it was my turn. After sharing my thoughts with the many teachers and families who I have known and considered to be friends, remaining kind and respectful to everyone in the room, I was verbally accosted and yelled at by multiple parents simply for having a different belief than theirs. Believing that sensitive topics like transgender, non-binary, and fluid gender identity not be taught to my children, or for feeling that my 12 and 14-year-old children should not have a sex ed class or share a locker room with a child of the opposite sex, I was ridiculed and insulted. I had shared a bit about my life, which was thrown back in my face. I know people in the room must have been uncomfortable and possibly even embarrassed. I guess what was most concerning to me was that these are the people that are teaching our children. If adults can't come together and speak for each other and speak to each other in a respectful manner, what are we teaching our kids? Family deserves better. As a mother, a boss, a business owner, a teacher, a community member, and a woman, I do my best to always hold myself to a standard of excellence. 
one that my children and the other children in my life that I care for can learn from. Be kind, be respectful, listen, be open and honest, always speak for those who can't, and always stand up for what you believe in. Thank you. Is there any, is there anyone else for public comment? Right. Right. Hilda, I'll see that you've arrived. Will you be recording? Yes. Okay. And you represent the Comic Con of Okay. Excellent. All right. Moving on. Yes. Thank you. I love you so much. Chris, I'd love you to read the mission statement. Okay. Uh, about public school mission statement is. Yes. The Bell Public School creates world-class student learning experiences. Our Clippers are empowered to pursue their goals with curiosity, integrity, and resiliency. The Bell Public School's vision, Clippers are creative, inquisitive, and engaged learners who participate in their community as socially responsible citizens. Clippers effectively communicate and solve problems that impact the world around them. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> I'd like to move into our regular meeting, and uh, I'd like to ask Lori to speak on the presentation of the 2023 Congregation Congressional Excuse me Congressional Art Competition. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're very excited uh, with this presentation tonight. I'm going to turn it over to um, Henry St. Julian to introduce our guests. Fantastic. I'm going to ask that uh, Lori and James Baker come on front with his chair in front here. And as they come up, I just wanted to say that um, each spring there's a nationwide uh, high school art competition, and it's sponsored by the House of Representatives. We're right there. Don't worry, I'm not blocked in. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to do it, but we're going to move it. The okay, that's good. <laughs> no, it's them. Anyway, uh, <laughs> that was a great idea. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> so, um, so the House of Representatives have this competition. Overall, uh, the overall competition winners are awarded best in show, and their submission is displayed at the uh, the Capitol building each year. The winning uh, submission. Uh, the Congressional Art began in 82, provides an opportunity for the Congress, members of Congress to encourage and recognize artistic uh, talents of our youngsters. And there's been 650,000 high schoolers that have been involved in this. And this year, members of Congress has uh, chosen artwork from our school. And I want to reveal this. Um, In the, in the hallway because from a distance you cannot see the intricate you know details so you gotta get up there and really close and see it's amazing so at this point i'm going to turn over to, to miss baker who really um spearheaded this thing can you give us the overall how this how this have happened well the first that's our new production the original is already hanging up in the capitol building in washington and um, I've been teaching studio art at the high school since 2004, and this is the first year we've always entered the congressional competition, our students. So what happens is over the course of the year, really juniors or seniors, I select work by students that really just sings, and it's really great, and there's different categories. And so between, uh, uh, anyway, so we send work every year, we cross our fingers, and every year somebody from the high school always wins something, you know, best painting or best print or best something or other. Never have won best in show. <laughs> some big fancy work on a pedestal, and you know, that person's going to Washington. So this year, Lauren was sitting in Studio Art 2, bored with the assignment. And in my class, if you don't want to do the project, you still have to do the project, but you can choose to do your sketchbook. There's always sketchbook time or project time. So Lauren was working the sketchbook, and I was looking at it with him. I was like, oh, very good drawings. And Lauren and I met in Zoom, what, freshman year? It was during COVID when 
I, he was all I could see was his forehead in a rectangle, <laughs> and he, he wasn't into it. And I don't blame him. And so we we didn't really connect freshman year. So here we are, junior year. He's got this great sketchbook, beautiful drawings, um, very famous people. And so I complimented them, and I said, "Oh, actually." And then earlier we talked about him enrolling in AP art in senior year. So he's got some catching up to do with portfolio wise. And I said, you know, these are beautiful, but we can't put them in a portfolio because they're famous people. You know, that's it's not technically plagiarism, but it's because it's sketchbook work. But if you took a drawing of a famous person, you couldn't submit it to college or to the college board or anything like that. So I suggested, you know, you're very good at drawing people and you're good at using your color pencils. Why don't you try drawing yourself? And he said, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so with 99% of the kids in the world, that's the last you hear of it. Then you know they're they're like, whatever, lady. But <laughs> he did it and he really and you know he really pulled it off. So when he brought it in, I, I looked at him and I was like, well, can we put this in a contest? Because then literally the next day I was driving everything to Plymouth. And he said, Yes, and, and there we go. So that's that's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh yeah. A special guest, would you like to recognize your special guest? Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now, I, I believe there are questions for our school, our school community. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. There's some questions for what? Yes. What do you have one? No. <laughs> what prompted you to do a self portrait? The prompting? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> my teacher had to. That's all the thing. 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 That's all uh, yeah. medium or do you do you do anything else or, or typically sketching? Uh, at the moment, I just work with colored pencil and pencil. So yeah, awesome. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. I know this next part hasn't been mentioned yet, but you will be going to DC to represent your sketch, which is super exciting. And I also know it's going to be kind of a whirlwind trip mm -hmm. outside of the presentation. Um, what are you looking forward to in DC? To kind of see what's there I see my first time so I don't know uh just taking it on yeah we gotta go to the national gallery you gotta look right yeah some mon monuments or I don't know yeah it's water yeah amazing great so um I, I would like to say this this is that we actually is really looking and seeing the child or and, and really trying to thrive and I really think um, Dr. Harris and um, Ms. Baker to really looking at him and finding ways to thrive. So I've had a good conversation with Dr. Harris going, I really want to make sure that this student thrives. And I think that's what we're doing. We're loving kids. So that's what we're doing this work. Yes. So at this time, we have something really special. So as your superintendent, I am so proud. This is very exciting. Um, so from the school committee, myself, we have a certificate of excellence uh, presented to you, Lord and Gregory, uh, for uh, receiving the best in show at the 2023 20, Congressional Art Competition, and it was signed by myself and the chair of the school committee, Melissa Cooper. Congratulations. Thank you so much for coming. Lord, and we have one more question. Oh, a couple of questions. Did you, get, uh, did you sign up for APR for your senior year? I did. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have an incredible talent. Yeah, thank you. Amazing. Yeah. So, um, and I'm wondering, and I don't know if you know the answer yet, but um, the original or uh, or maybe this version will will it be on display somewhere in the building? And I think, it, you know, it's a great way to encourage you. Yeah, this is a copy for, for this building. Oh, it's saying yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a reproduction. 
the original is in Washington. I'll right. hope so we can lend it out to the high school at some point so other students can have it there too. Yeah. <laughs> Great, I love that. Chris. I have one more question. Um, I was wondering if you have an idea for a next big piece. Is there something that you wanted to draw that, that you haven't yet that you're looking to? Uh, well, I was thinking about drawing a what's the name? Bob Marley. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's the next piece on my board. Um, the trick is for the portfolio. <laughs> what about what so, am I logo? Okay. Sorry, he has to balance the things he likes to draw, okay. and then he can make money on because people are commissioning him to draw now. Oh, I was the piece. Wait for my logo. I think Mike has a question. Um, not even a question, but this is fantastic. I mean, they did great work, and then not some advice. You got to wear that jacket in DC. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you to the parents. Yeah. Um, so glad you're here and everything you've done to support uh, Lauren and his uh, journey in art. <laughs> Right now, I'd like to um, make a motion to act on a field trip to Washington, D.C. for Lauren. Okay. okay. Um, is there any discussion? The I wish you had a One thing. So, oh, right. the chaperones are Henry and Wendy. Are Lauren and Sarah able to go? That would have been the first place. Oh, I just wanted to see if there was because. Yeah. It, we wanted to make sure he got there and, and uh, Henry stepped up so he could make sure he got those pieces. <laughs> Any other discussion? No. All right, let's vote. Uh, Mike, I'll start with you. On Kaylin, yes. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Great. Yes. Well, yes. Marker? Susan, yes. Jerry, yes. Well, speak, yeah. This passes. This is very exciting. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yes, so our next uh, presentation is on um, our composting plankton. Uh, I will say that, um, uh, well, you can come to the table. I'll introduce you. So we um, have. Um, Lauren McGann did her uh, civic project on uh, composting, and we have uh, Mel Nice, because she is our uh, learning partnership specialist, uh, and she has been working on the industry. Um, prior to COVID, we started uh, talking about composting. Uh, things got put on hold, uh, but we started up our team this year uh, and have uh, made some great progress in our plans. Uh, we've also been working with the Solid Waste um, Advisory Committee for the town. Uh, and uh, so things are moving along. If uh, people are hearing about what we're doing, and they're very excited, but I don't want to get any more details. But I, I'm just kind of right over to uh, Carmela and Lauren. Thank you. Okay, so I can hear this is Lauren again, a very recent graduate of Foundation. <laughs> um, and to uh, give you guys some information on why we want to do this. I'm going to give you some information on how we're hoping to do this. Um, and then hopefully at the end, we'll be impressed. All right. So, um, our current issue right now is that we are taking a look at um, the way that students dispose of their food and their trash. And we noticed that a lot of it is you know, things like apple cores and orange peels that we could be reusing. Um, it can be able to our gardens outside, and many students are even aware that you can be contributing to local gardens really without even trying. Um, according to the World Wildlife Fund, a typical elementary school throws away 18,000 pounds of food waste per year. That's for each elementary school per year. And the total amount of food waste generated by elementary schools across the U.S. could reach 530,000 tons per year every single year. 
Uh, the amount of waste being produced by a school, it's not only expen expensive to handle um, disposing of all of that waste, but it's also bad for the environment to throw away as much um, food waste as we did. And so, um, I can start. So basically, the next part um, is our, our research. So we were asked to write a, by uh, Ms. Phipps a 10 or eight to 10 page research paper on this topic. So I got a lot of background information that someone who's familiar with gardening, but it was nice to know all of the science and all of the um, numbers for that. So research shows that the use of fertilizers causes eutrophication, you know, algae blooms, and then the subsequent death of the algae, which leads to anoxic conditions and kills fish. Um, in those bodies of water, which especially come on Cape, where we have so many really important um, waterways and water systems, um, you know, estuaries, bays, and excess chemical fertilizer runoff in water supplies is bad for wildlife health. And according to the Cape Cod Commission, nearly six million pounds of fertilizer are applied in Cape Cod. There's such a huge amount of fertilizer put such in a small area. Um, some schools, including some colleges and some high schools and elementary schools across the country. Um, have achieved this, like just using um, their trash and their composting, including the Marine Biological Laboratory. I was fortunate enough to be able to spend a week there with the Discovery Program. And something that we noticed was they had all of them right next to their um, this trash, recycling, compost. So there was no, there was also like signs that showed exactly what needed to be put in there. So there was no question about, oh, I can just throw my um, compost into the trash bin just because it's closer. All of it was right there and it was um, easy access. <laughs> So, we'll be first to mention this is a transition, so we click the button again <laughs> and I'll slide it in. So, we had a compost Wednesday for a few uh, Wednesdays. Um, me, uh, Nikki, and Deborah, who were helping me out with this project, we were all working on it together. Um, we brought in some bins and were able to collect compost from uh, the cafeteria as well as from students. And a lot of students were very open to this. You know, we felt a little weird going up to them to ask, you know, can I have that? Can I have that? <laughs> Can I take that? I look confused, but I even had a few students um, the next day on that Thursday ask, oh, I saved my, I saved my apple cores. Can you want them still? And I see my orange because you want them, and I was like, sure, I'll just go bring them up to it. <laughs> so we were able to, to bring those over to the um, garden outside of High School, which I had the pleasure of working with a lot throughout the class and in my defense study. Yeah, we just really thought it was nice to start small. Yeah, well, okay. Sorry, I don't know how to do it. So what worked for us in our small scale pilot, this is just a slide that I wrote um, for my senior project, so it's not one that I edited after this. So this is just what we found um, from my, our own experience, what worked and what we could be improving on. Uh, it was great to collaborate with the farm and start with our small and then expand larger. Um, and having students monitoring what goes into the bin, like me, Nikki, and Deborah knew exactly what could and um, couldn't be composted. And we could improve having compost daily or officially dispose of it and work with black earth composting, which is something that I heard from a friend of mine um, who uses that every day at his house. And uh, having more education, relying on students to do it themselves eventually, like they get more experience with it and starting from the elementary school level. So it just becomes more um, natural and not sort of like, the, oh, we have to separate everything. That's super weird. Instead, it's like, oh yeah, this goes in, this goes there. And it's just natural. <laughs> All right, so um, apparently I also did the transition. My apologies to your fingers. Um, so the funny thing is, is that Lauren and I worked together on this last week um, when I asked her to help me present. And the funny thing was, is that she had a beautiful list of what worked. And the funny thing was that when we worked together as a group, we came up with a lot of the same ideas that they came up with. So you guys came up with some fantastic ideas. So the other thing that I wanted to say was um, I did not do this on my own. Um, I worked with Rose Moran, um, Heather Rivera, and I wrote everybody down so they won't try to get anybody, Stacey Strong and Jill Mazur. We all worked together to figure out how we're gonna begin this. So basically, as Lauren suggested, we are gonna start small. Um, so we are gonna start, well, not too small, as small home is the biggest elementary school, but we're gonna start small um, and we are gonna start with um, small and home. So Mullen Hall is going to start um, composting starting this September. They're going to start on day one when the kids come in and they go to the cafeteria. It's just going to become common. They're going to say, oh, here's the composting um, and here's the trash. Um, so also, we will be working with Black Earth Composting. And we, Lori and I have also met with the Family Solid Waste Advisory Committee, which is behind us on this decision. 
Um, so as I said, there's going to be books and educational materials. I know that Rose has been looking for um, books put in the classrooms for the kids about composting. Um, we have already spoken with Black Earth. Um, we're going to have totes brought in um, from Black Earth, and they have different sizes. They suggested certain sizes because they had more than seals before. So for smaller kids, they suggest smaller sizes. Kids can actually reach over and put things in. Um, so we have to talk about that. There will be totes in the cafeteria. Um, and then Rose also suggested that we had extra emergency buckets that we can put in the classrooms for any time you generate food waste and it's not in the cafeteria. Uh, and then there is going to be signage that is provided by Black Earth, which clearly states what can and cannot be put into the composting bins. Um, yeah. And so this is where the creative part comes in. And I'm really excited about this idea. It's an awesome idea. So the little produce tags that you see on the apple, it's on all the produce. Uh, it usually has a PLU number, so when they ring you up, they know what number to put in. Well, it's very great and convenient for the grocery stores to do that. However, it's not great for people that are trying to compost. Um, because unfortunately, those little tags are not compostable. And those little tags can literally ruin an entire batch of compost. So you need to figure out ways to get the kids to take the stickers off. So what better way than we're going to give them a blank mural that we're going to put up on the wall behind the composting. And the kids are going to be encouraged to take their stickers off their produce and stick it to the wall. And we're going to see if we can hopefully complete the mural by the end of the year. Um, so we came up with a couple ideas. We were thinking that maybe we could come up with a Mako or we could have a clipper ship, but lots of different ideas. And I think the kids will be really excited to put their stickers up there. And of course, the other bonus part of this is hopefully it will encourage the kids to eat more fruits and vegetables because they want those stickers. Um, so that's good too. Um, so initially, we want to have lunchroom staff that are going to be assigned to monitor the totes to make sure that we don't contaminate the compostables. Um, but eventually, we would like the students to take ownership and have them be keeping an eye out to make sure that their um, classmates aren't um, contaminating the compost. Uh, the other idea was that Mullen Hall is going to switch over to stainless steel utensils because if you think about it, you're more in a mindset of throwing out a plastic fork or spoon or whatever than if you have stainless steel. You know, stainless steel, you don't chuck it in the garbage. Um, so we're hoping that that will help the kids not to put those into the little container. Um, we are going to purchase scales that we can put the totes on top of so that we can keep track of how much food waste we're saving from the landfill, which is a great opportunity for teachers in math or science to do activities about, you know, which month did we make the most or make graphs of it, or this is what we, you know, this is what a website that we looked up anticipates how much we would generate. How do we compare to that? Um, and then the other nice thing is that Black Earth is very flexible, so they are willing to change pickup schedules or coat sizes depending on what we decide our needs are. So that's where we begin. So then, of course, our next steps is once we have Mullen Hall doing um, composting for a while, we're obviously going to talk to them and discuss their best practices, what they learned, about what worked, what didn't work. Um, we'll fine tune the tote sizes and when we want the pickups and how often we want the pickups, the educational materials that we're going to use and we're going to get the kids. The other thing is, is that we can invite families to join in with us as well. Um, Black Earth does pick up on the Cape quite a bit, actually, so they're willing to have families sign up and do that as well. Um, and actually, I just recently found out that apparently you can go to the transfer station and you can actually leave compost there as well, which Funny enough, is actually regulated and not taken care of by Black Earth. Um, and then the other thing is that we can get compost from Black Earth to use again in the gardens at Mullen Hall. So, good part of it. And then our end goal, and this is this is our, I hope it will happen, our future plans. Um, we would like to have compost when you recycle the all over the space. Um, because it's really the right decision. It's the right decision for our kids, it's the right decision for our environment, and it's just the right thing to do. Um, we would like to have a district wide switch over to stay in the field utensils with usable trays and dishes. Um, as of right now, there is actually no compostable brand of uh, tray that Black Earth will accept because they are all contaminated with PFAS. Um, we want to have some educational programs throughout all the grades that are going to explain the importance of doing composting and recycling and then how to implement those steps at home. Um, which goes really well with our um, basically our district wide um, idea of environmental stewardship. We'd like to have widespread family participation. 
Um, we'd like to also explore green fee membership, which is a state run program, which is really good. It, it talks about conflicting, but several other things about saving energy and things like that. Um, but again, the end goal is less food waste, less plastic waste, less fertilizer, more compost, mm -hmm. and then hopefully a healthier environment for our kids and also for the animals that we share in the home with. So it's a really great idea. I'm so excited to present it to you, and I'm so excited to see it in action. Um, and I'm I'm really looking forward to this. So. And I thank you, Lauren, for having me to present this because it's a lot easier to like two people up here. Um, but yes, thank you so much for your, uh, for your work. Oh, that's great. Are there any questions or comments? Heather, <laughs> of course, lots of questions. Um, uh, okay. Three questions, I'll kind of throw them all at you at once. You can take them in whatever order you want. Um, I'm, I'm curious um, what challenges you anticipate mm -hmm. and what you expect to be, I know you said pilot for a while, how long you expect that pilot at Mullen Hall to last and what the um, conditions for, for further rollout might be. And then also curious whether there are any plans to tie this in with the climate and food justice um, curriculum, given the climate change regenerative farming connections with composting. Yes. Tying in with the food justice initiative, absolutely. This would be great for Ben. And as a matter of fact, I think Ben has actually worked with Blackbird to get conference, I think, for the um for the greenhouse. So absolutely. Yeah, and also Ben was with us from the very beginning. So yeah. he's on the committee. Yeah. So just yeah, yeah he was he's very much supportive of this committee. Um also when I did mention those people, we broke off into a smaller committee just to figure out the logistics of getting it started, but these are not by any means all the people that were involved in doing that. Um, so yes, absolutely. But the, it would be a perfect fit. Um, as far as how long the pilot lasts, there's a lot, there's a lot of things we have to take into account. Um, first of all, switching over to stainless steel and uh, reusable trays and everything, get, get the dishwashers back into the schools. So there's a lot of other things that have to fall in place before you can just start. Um, the other thing is we wanted to start small and just see how it goes. And if you know if it's really successful. And we do it for two or three months, and the kids are like, "Oh, this is this is easy. This is a rocket science." You know we're, what we're hoping is like, you know, the kids that are in elementary school are going to start saying to their parents, "Well, you know, at school we compost. Can we compost at home?" And then maybe their older siblings are like, "Well, why are we composting at Mullet Hall and we're not composting at Lawrence?" So we're hoping that that will spread really quickly and that it'll be a quick buy-in. And so as soon as we have, you know, more people interested. Which is why I didn't give a specific timeline because I wanted to make sure that we had wiggle room to either speed it up or slow it down depending on how we can access what we need and money as well. Um, what was the last question you asked? Challenges. Challenges. Oh, challenges. Um, money. <laughs> um, obviously, the district has to pay for it. Um, and but we are hopefully there's a couple of people that can help us with that and grants that can help us with that as well. Um, and then you know getting in the new supplies. I think. Changing the mindset is going to be a, a little bit of a challenge, but to be completely honest with you, I think it's going to be more on the grown up end and the kid end. So I think the kids are going to really pick it up quick and be like, Yeah, duh, of course we do those. Um, so I think that's going to be a little bit of a challenge. Um, the other thing is, is that uh, as of right now, Black Earth is off Cape, so we have to send our compost. However, there are plans in place. Hopefully, that will be forever. Um, because that is obviously a huge carbon cost when we have to ship your stuff way out there. Um, but hopefully, that will change in the near future. Um, I don't know if you think of any other challenges. That's an <laughs> I will say, I want to give credit to the uh, All of Waste Advisory Committee. Yeah. Um, they were very excited to hear about the, the plans and they have offered for us to submit for a grant. Um, so the grant, so we can get started with Mullen Hall and if we get the grant, that'll help us um, bring on the other schools too. So, and then, then we can figure out over time, you know, how, how we're gonna like absorb this. I just heard you mention contamination. What could contaminate the, um, So anything that's not, Compostable that is in the like the little pieces on the apples. Okay. Yep. That and so the thing, the way that Black Earth uh, manages it is that basically when the driver comes, picks up the compost, he lifts up the lid, he or she lifts up the lid, um, and looks inside. And if there's anything 
blatantly there, like plastic forks, knives, spoons, whatever, things that aren't supposed to be there, they'll photograph it and then they send it to us. And then we have to actually empty out that tote on our own, but they still charge us for pickup. So there isn't like a, an extra fee added in, like, hey, you messed up, we're going to charge you $50. It's, we're still going to charge you for pickup, but you have to be care of yourself, which won't be that difficult. Obviously, we do have dumpsters and we have dumpster pickup. Um, hopefully, the nice thing about this is that we'll have fewer dumpster pickups because we'll be putting a lot of food waste into the compost. Mm -hmm. um, but so that's that's what will happen. So that's nice. Chris? Um, I remember I, I looked at their website um, and didn't they have like a threshold, like right? if there was a certain amount of community members that participated in the program, it might reduce the cost? Yes. Have they reached that threshold or if you can get more family participation, if that could? Yeah, I don't think that. they've reached that threshold yet in Falmouth. I know they do a lot of pickups in Falmouth. Okay. Um, but the other thing is, is if we have family participation, um, that will help us on with the district bill, which will be nice. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, if we can get the composting location on the Cape, that would obviously lower the price because you wouldn't have to pay for the gas and move it off. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of other things that can affect the price, and hopefully that will happen soon. Any other questions? Um, so I'm wondering um, if we, as we start the next capital budget process and start prioritizing, if we need to build in for dishwashers or whatever we should be thinking about that so that we can roll out what if we can't get grant coverage i don't want a dishwasher to be the bigger so so uh, the we have a plan for the dishwashers uh, so fortunately um over the last few years as um we've had universal free uh you know yeah. breakfast and, and lunch we still got uh reimbursed from usda they now want us to start spending down this funds and we have the funds to put in the dishwashers and the other store purchase the famous or not famous things i guess waters whatever stainless steel thank you um flatware so that we can start moving toward that and it's a great way to spend the dollars that we have saved actually over the last few years. That's great. But that's, that's so we do have a plan. It might take a while to get them in. <laughs> you know, yeah. gotta figure out the space and, and such. But, you know. Margaret, if I'm correctly, you just graduated? Yeah. I know you continue to be involved in this. Oh, I would love to like keep doing it. I mean, for, so I did took the race climate food class, and then after that, I took an independent study. So I have a small section of the garden dedicated to flowers and pollinators. Um, and I was talking to Dr. Harden, and they said if there was a summer program that kept um, going, you know, that worked in that garden, that I would be totally interested in, like, helping out with that and, you know, helping out with the compost and everything. I still, even though I graduated, I'm back here, and I'm still tutoring um, students, so I don't get to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm the other with my daughter, so uh, I'll know how to talk to her. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Okay, I have a few. Um, so is Black Earth where are they the old composting with me? I think they bought out with us. They yeah, bought so, out. Yeah. So composting with me is no longer on the cave. So we're sending right. so everything the families in town that were doing composting with me, their compost is being sent off Cape. Just a backpack. Okay. Um, and are we doing comp are we doing three bins, composting, recycle, and trash? As of right now, like I'm thinking composting and trash, but I would like to get to the point where we have the same type system that MBL has, which is compost, trash, recycling. Because it makes sense. It, yeah. Um, okay. Um, I would hope that the stickers would come off when they wash their fruit before they eat it, but that's just another name. Mm -hmm. um, years ago, when we had to vote to get rid of the dishwashers in the district, I was very hesitant about it and I love to see that they're coming back with the stainless steel flatware and the plates and perhaps glasses as well um I never I don't personally I don't like eating off plastic we try very hard not to eat off plastic um so I I think that that Falmouth does a really good job with um getting away from that <laughs> getting you know we as a town got rid of um for the most part, uh, styrofoam. So mm -hmm. I think that this is just proving that our clippers are really innovative and um, being mindful of Mother Earth and how we can make it better. And I thank you. 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 Thank you.
Um, and then, so the composting goes to the transfer station and then it goes off Cape. And that composting that we're doing in the schools doesn't stay here. Is there it a, goes up to there, and I don't please forgive me, I don't remember the town of there. That's right. Okay. But it goes there, say, oh, okay. So they go up, they compost it, they process it. And then, um, from my understanding, I guess everybody that is enrolled in Black Earth, I guess their compost picks up, gets a voucher every year for like a bag of compost. So, obviously, we're a school and like a bag of compost isn't going to do much. So we can obviously talk about that. Um, but you get a little voucher and it drop off the compost at certain locations. You go into the location, you give it a voucher, you take the bag of compost. Um, but obviously we can work with them on that because that would be somewhat inconvenient as a school. Um, but that's definitely a possibility. But that's see, that's the importance of getting a composting statement on the Cape. And I believe that the Cape Cod Commission has talked about getting one in lower, I think, uh, upper Cape, middle Cape, and lower, or I might have said that wrong, upper, middle, and lower Cape to cover the Cape. Um, I've heard discussions about that. So hopefully it's in the works. Hopefully it won't be too long. Um, but I think, you know, found the public school saying, hey, we're composting. You guys need to get a composting station around here is probably a good. Um, a good start. Excellent. Well, thank you all. We can see you. Yeah. How come we're not going to do recycling? How come we're not going to do three since we're starting this? We haven't talked about it yet, but obviously, I mean, that would be the next step. I mean, we do recycling in the district. <laughs> no, but yes, but I know, I understand right there. So, I mean, Okay. Yeah. Honestly, we're yeah. so excited that we actually might get to get well, started. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think this is wonderful, but if we're doing this, it's the same way. Right, and I think about I think the food waste is a very large component of waste that we're getting rid of, and so I think we want to start with that first, get that taken care of, and then I'd love to do all three. That'd be awesome. Or two for a second later. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate you coming. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Lori. Moving on to. Okay, so um, annually at this time, I can be present to you uh, our uh, success plans to the school committee. Uh, in the last few years, we have done district wide goals for our schools. Uh, and we are continuing that. Um, before we get started, since we have new uh, school committee members, I'd like to introduce um, our principals. I think you know the directors, but I'll introduce them as well. So we have um, Dr. Alan Harris at the high school. We have Mr. Tom Booty at Lawrence. Mr. Tim Adams at Morris Pond. We have uh, Ms. Rose Moran at uh, Marlon Hall. Um, Ms. Anthony Capabellis at Tea Ticket, and Mr. Good, uh, Paul Goodhine at uh, ESOM. And I am sorry to say that um, uh, Ms. Sierra, Rebecca Vieira at North um, was planning to be here. She had an emergency this afternoon, um, but is keeping her from us tonight. We will pick up her part for her because that's what we do as a team. <laughs> so also we have Dr. Tellier. Um, we have uh, Mr. St. Julian. And we have um, uh, Joe. <laughs> Joe Santa and, uh, and Mary Vance uh, as part of our, our team. So um, we're excited to be able to uh, present. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Tony. Sure. I think good. Right. Henry, I'm Henry. sorry. I'm, I'm passing on. <laughs> Okay. So um, 
I have a couple slides, so I'm excited. So first of all, um, I love this slide. It says equity through uh, cultural efficiency because we have a world that's becoming more and more increasingly diverse, and how we engage a diverse population is our goal. And so this is very important. So this is not only for uh, the kids, but for, for our overall community. That's why I like that we're doing this. Next slide. Thank you. So now the, the why, why are we doing, what, why are we doing the equity in uh, with uh, cultural proficiency? For me, uh, we have a moral responsibility to be welcoming, to be, to celebrate kids, to affirm all people. In past generations, generations schools have served one cult, one dominant culture, and at Falmouth, uh, at Falmouth, educators are reflecting on their collective and individual bias and privilege that prevents us from looking at the needs, especially specifically for marginalized people. Recently, I had a, a conversation with a marginalized student who just graduated, and I asked him two questions. Have there been anyone in our school system that supported you? And number two, how have they supported you? And that student went right away, multiple, multiple teachers said, this person, this person, this person, I've been contacting these uh, educators, and the student said, how they help that person is to listen to students. They want A, you need to listen to students, B, you need to create an open and accepting classroom to relate to students' individual needs, to foster a trust between student and teacher, and basically overall staff loving students. Staff loving students, that was it, and it's known, it's felt, it's appreciated, and uh, that, that was the message I got, and that's equity. Staff loving students, staff breaking down, I love this uh, definition, but it's basically staff breaking down uh, barriers to provide access for all students to thrive in, at uh, um, for all students. Equity work is for all, especially those who we need uh, to include the, in, the diverse people. Ultimately, loving students and making them a, a place of belonging is our uh, opportunity. So I love this vision. This is look at this vision. Who am I? understand me, respect me, like me, and I will learn. I'm telling you right now, the smiles of that young man was, it's not normal. That's not a normal look. And since then, that's all I see is from Lord, the smile, yes. That's the, that's the equity that we want here. Next slide. Where, where are we doing this? Founded on our professional learning, found it needs to be intentional to foster student growth and excellence for all learners. And that means equity, equity and cultural proficiency must impact these aspects here. Must impact relationship and interaction, loving our students. Must impact uh, shared values. Must impact school culture. Must impact uh, pedagogy. Must impact curriculum, shared practices and policy. These are all a must if you want to have equity and um, cultural proficiency. Then the next slide, which is the how. You know, we say, I'm a clipper. Well, how do we do this? Does this mean that it has to be like one person? Does it mean like it's just the guy with a title that's going to do that? No. We're going to use the story. That whole thing that I had watched today with uh, Lord, it was not me at all. This guy here to, to my left. Yeah. This guy here to my left and a whole group made sure that they look at that student, looking in student and seeing what we need to do to make sure this happened. It was not even me. I get the I get the, the joy of escorting that person. I don't know how that happened, but um, but it is uh, a lot of people in here. So I'm teaching a class uh, called Collective Equity, and it's basically, it's looking at the staff. What does the staff do? It's not an addition. It's how they see. It's how they engage. It's how they um, go and do their classroom. It's, it's it's everyone basically doing it. And it's staff, too. It's not just teachers. It's the bus driver. It's the lunch play. It's everyone uh, that comes in and says, how am I going to, am I going to uh, love students? And that's our goal. So we are in the district, we are going, we're making teams throughout the system and we are we are basically saying, hey, we need to look at our bias and privilege. No, no one, we need to look at um, data. Well, not opinions, not what, we need to look at data. We need to look at realistic and effective plans of action. And we need to be continually, continually evaluating, make sure is it working? Is it something that is fruitful? Is it um, helping breaking down? And when we say I'm a cooker, I hope, my hope is that the meeting goes, 
I receive or I am receiving a 21st century world classification. And it comes through this. That's not. And so now I get to introduce somebody, the wonderful and fabulous Miss Moran. Thank you so much. So thank you, So can we start that out? How do we do it in English? Come from the district, the district lens. When you look at these events, this is, this is a snapshot of events or moments across the district that might happen, but there are many more daily within the classroom. Some of the ones that we've had are the expansion of library collections across the district that we've partnered with eight cousins to increase diversity in our classroom libraries, our Indigenous People Day celebration across the district, the inclusion of cultural proficiency series in our mentoring inclusion, the creation of Learning Access Advisory Committee. We've opened access to our honors, AP and advanced classroom placement. We have increased our personal emotional learning, and we've had our expansions of English language development department and our racial trauma training with counseling and staff to name and our beloved community forums to make those connections with family, students, and staff. And at Mullen Hall, in order to bring it down to the staff level, we had um, 24 teachers that um signed on to a team building uh, professional practice goal was to increase cultural proficiency across our um, classrooms. We had action steps, and one of our action steps was to, um, we have highlighted the multicultural fair that we worked with the coalition of children um, in the Mullen Hall School and the four other elementary principals. And if you believe that culture is built with what you do through the school community, your school climate is how you feel when you're at school. Connecting students to their schools of old is a vital part of something bigger than just themselves. Understanding one's own culture and connecting into their school culture creates a climate of acceptance and understanding. As cookers, we all have cultural heritages from all over the world. And at Mullen Hall, we had one event that fostered our beloved community as our multicultural fair. Together, Family Public Schools and the Coalition of Children hosted this amazing event in May. Families and community members came together and volunteered to share their home cultures. This powerful event was open to the public and well attended by visitors of all ages. And if you came to the fair, you were given a passport and you traveled through the building in the cafeteria and visited many different countries. We had representation from Cape Verde, South Africa, Poland, Brazil. Jamaica, Turkey, and the Wampanoag tribe. We had exhibits of food, arts, books, music, games, and stories from around the world. And we are already planning next year's event. Thank you. And now I am going to introduce the most excellent. The most excellent. The most excellent. The most excellent. Uh, so thank you very much. I, I want to speak a little bit about uh, the work that's been done in advanced placement coursework at Chamba High. When Mr. Kazarian was here a little while back, he noted the the launch will increase the number of AP tests that were given this year at, at Chamba High. So I just want to take a little bit of step back and talk about it. one of the things about educational leadership and the work done by school committees and superintendents and principals is. You plant seeds and do work, and sometimes the fruits don't come for a little while. So just to give you a glimpse of this picture, in the 2018-2019 school year, there were 186 students at Falmouth High that took advanced placement courses. Okay, that's the number of students. Some of those students might have taken multiple courses that shared the number of students. In the 22-23 school year, 210. That's a 44 student increase over that time, while but school enrollment was declining. Okay. I share that with you because that is the work of Mary Gans and Dr. Tellier and our department chairs in science and social studies and English and everywhere else, making really thoughtful decisions about the types of courses they offer and the way in which they connect with students. And when you think about students that have been traditionally marginalized from AP classes, there were 16 students who were either. American Indian, Asian, Black, Hispanic, or two or more races in, in 1819. 
This year there are 25 students who represent those different. And I share that with you because what you saw today is the example of what excellence and equity look like. So we talk a lot at Found the Pi about excellence without equity is privilege and equity without excellence is tokenism. You have to continually pursue both of those entities together and be tireless in that effort. And what you saw was a teacher who looked a student in the eye who did not think himself capable and said, I see you as this. One of the most significant efforts that's been made by our, by our teachers, notably in social studies department, but in many other departments too, is the opening of doors and raising of expectations. So typically in AP classes, there were, there were doors and barriers to get through. You needed to be in an honors class before you could take an AP. You needed a teacher recommendation before you could take an AP. And they slowly removed those barriers and created the open opportunities. So I'll, I'll give you one last example. In, in 2019, Mr. Gennaro, one of our AP psychology teachers had a student who had had a rough sophomore year. So AP classes are primarily taken by juniors and seniors almost entirely. And that student said to Mr. Gennaro and to Mr. Feeney, I just think I could do it if I was given a chance. And they gave him a chance. And Mr. Gennaro talked about the student developed his own note-taking system and persevered. And I asked Mr. Gennaro, when you bring in students who have not traditionally been in AP classes, in what ways does it change your instruction? And he said, it doesn't change my expectations and outcomes for them one bit. I just have to look and listen because they might approach it in a different way. And it, it's, it's to me an example of the best of, you know, why I'm so honored to be in Founders Public Schools, the investment in what happens here and then the opportunity for the student, for teachers to do that. Mr. Cini has worked tirelessly to think intentionally about what courses we offer in advanced placement that create the most opportunity for students. So. Mr. Kazari had noted that AP Human Geo had the highest number of students taking the course, taking the test. That was intentional because they selected that course on creating that opportunity based on the interest of our students. So it's just, it's just one of the multiple two ways that many, many things have been happening and found that for, for a good while that, you know, I, I get the privilege of beginning to see those, those outcomes where I teach. But with that, I am going to turn it over to somebody. So, as we look beyond our work uh, in health and provisions, we start to get more into some of the opportunities that we're working really hard to create. So, our students can also see themselves in the calendar. Absolutely, can help them understand uh, everything that's available to them. And I think the earlier we introduce them, right, the more opportunities they see, the more hopeful they are about finding their place. And in part, uh, that was really our first conversation with uh, Dr. Ben Harden and when we met with he and Andre Price and Matt Lyles, um, Matt having graduated from Tom, but those were our conversations about creating opportunities where students can see themselves uh, saying and found that no matter what they choose to do and whether college or advanced learning in a particular um, trade or skill uh, is in their future. So as we developed our partnership um, with the greater community of Woods Hole and found it, we were able to look beyond, uh, I think what we traditionally thought of as science and research roles and really uh, move beyond that and create some hands-on opportunities where our students can also see the work of IT communications, uh, welding, then we learned about the cross set, uh, the cross skill set of diving and welding and what that takes for the research vessel and continuing to grow that. So all the way from uh, experiences in kindergarten with Ocean's Day happening Thursday and Friday this week. Mm -hmm. Thank you again for hosting. So uh, and then growing all the way through some formal opportunities. And you heard um, Carmela earlier talk about the experience last year was at CRISPR and this year was a different immersive experience with MDL. But creating those opportunities for our students um, really understand what's available to them. And when we started out, it certainly was ambitious. And as it's coming into focus, not only do we have one experience at each grade level that you know was our original hope, uh, but we're starting to see multiple and we're starting to see them complement each other and span the year. In our students, different exposures and opportunities. 
So along with that work um, and really clarifying our goal statement, <clears throat> we want to continue, uh, continue to sustain this engagement with our partners and continue to enrich teaching and learning with these hands-on authentic engagement opportunities situated in the living classrooms of Fennel, along the coast, in our parks, and, uh, and different sites with our partners. And when we take it out to our partners, we turn our school campuses into their, um, their labs, right? We bring everything to us and give opportunities. The pictures you see here are third grade students uh, on their recent expedition to the village. Uh, and this is from uh, MBL. And one of the students, the student on the left, is holding the sea urchin on their uh, face jacket with their, with their hands, so you can see the, the awe, the expression. And then the other is Carmela facilitating um, in the Marine Research Center, facilitating their selection of different organisms to look at. And all of this is designed around you know, the world class opportunities and research that's happening there, but providing our students that opportunity to see firsthand and uh, hear them learn about the octopus that can regenerate not only its arm, but part of its brain cells, or the cartilage that they're using from uh, the rays to think about joint replacements. Um, and those are just a couple of the quick takeaways that the students come back amazed and, and able to talk about. Um, then we just grow from there. So as we're thinking about all of this, um, really honing in uh, what we were hoping to achieve this year was growing the role of the learning partnership specialist and continuing to maintain relationships with our partners, cultivating the skills to empower our teachers to plan and facilitate partnership-sponsored learning. Most of our opportunities came from um, experiences that one or two teachers might have been planning at one school and scaling across the grade level through the work of grade level leaders. Uh, I was actually two teachers at TPICIT who created the experience for the third grade day in the village. Uh, and then creating the STEAM Fair and having it really be a community expo, which we are continuing to work towards and getting those hands-on opportunities built in there. So what I'd love to be able to do to help us get a clearer picture of our progress is turn it over to the absolutely astounding. <laughs> 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 Um, so we have a slide here um, that shows um, certainly not the exhaustive list of all the um, opportunities that the students are engaging in. And I think what's important to highlight is that um, when you see the list of field trips or um, partnership experiences, those are for all students now, K-8, and then that um, at high school, they have some um, experiences with MBL as well. So it's a nice opportunity for all of the students to have those same experiences. Um, we also continue to work with the um, outdoor learning committee. So we have our monthly meetings and they're supporting their school. I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, the carts and things that we have for outdoor learning in a few minutes. Um, I know everybody had heard about the CAST program recently. So that's when our um, students from the Lawrence School get an opportunity to teach our third graders about forces in motion. Um, we also continue with our partnership with the tribe and the, um, the experiences that all students are getting um, when they make the visits to the, all of the schools. And then some of our um, before and after school um, programs or after school programs that we have um, as well. So I think I wanted to um, to highlight a couple of things at the um, at the tea ticket school. So um, the outdoor learning, and I think everybody might have a different perception of outdoor learning. So as you know, when we joined COVID, we added um, two tents at our school, but we also have other outdoor spaces where students can learn. So we have a courtyard in the center of our school, and then we have the, the two tents. We obviously have the uh, we have a kitty garden labyrinth area, and then we have the amazing tea ticket park. So I wanted to talk um, a little bit about those opportunities. And I think outdoor learning can be as simple as, you know, sometimes where the teachers are like, you know, it's a great opportunity, the weather is good, let's grab the math books or whatever the students are doing, and they head outside to do their, their work. There's also other times when there's planned lessons, you know, science or math lessons, they might be blowing bubbles and looking at the spheres and thinking about things in, um, in that manner um, as well. So the outdoor learning committee has been very supportive for the school. Um, we all have carts at our school, multiple carts. 
And uh, within the COTS, this really is a, um, a helpful tool to get from point A to B. So um, it is, has a whole bunch of resources, basic things that you might need when you're going to bring your students outside, like whiteboards and markers and crayons. And then has some pretty cool things like um, uh, things to put bugs in, magnifying glasses, binoculars, and then flashlights. So um, the, the, that's really that's really helpful to all of us. Um, we at the tea ticket school, I, I feel like blessed is definitely the right word um, to have access to the tea ticket park. So I don't know if everybody's had an opportunity to go over there before, but it's it is it's a great experience. And so when the 300 committee worked with us a few years ago. Um, we have a great little path that goes right over from the back of our school um, to the to the park, and they have the amphitheater there as well, some seating, and then obviously two little loops around the park. So this this um, you know during COVID, you know, we definitely had classes going over there, um, but then we've sustained it over time. So every week, I think classes are going over to the to the park, and even our preschoolers walk over to the park, which is pretty which is pretty special. Um, and I think what all of our grade levels do is they um, they definitely focus on the seasons when they're going over to the park. That's one thing that they can do. So in the fall, you know, they might have a scavenger hunt or a nature walk, and they have the students looking for things like the type of plants they see, the bugs, the wildlife. Um, all of those kinds of things. And then they might journal about that. They make another trip in the winter. And then again, they're comparing things. And then again, in the spring. So in the spring, there's also other special opportunities. Obviously, you might be able to see a lot more things. So um, there, you know, we have all of our butterflies that the students are watching the metamorphosis in school and they're releasing the butterflies, um, looking at the pollinators over in the, in the tea ticket park. And some of the other um, wildlife, so it's it's a pretty special um, experience. And actually, we've done some book walks over there as well. So I don't; those are open to the community. So it's another chance for us to do that outdoor learning piece. And um, just yesterday, a funny story: um, our fourth graders all went to Tea Ticket Park, so all three sections. And uh, one of the students, when they had come back from the park, was you know smiling ear to ear. And I was like, "What, what did you guys see? What did you do?" And, so two two teachers um, were able to uh, rescue a bird who was entwined in some red red yarn or string. They put him back to the school, got some gloves and scissors, and flipped the string and freed the bird. So like the learning experiences are not are you, know, you never know what you're going to get when you go there. And you know for the students, it's it really is an amazing opportunity. Um, so one other thing I want to talk about for another another spotlight is the um, science fair. So our third graders have been um, participating in the science fair each year for, for many years, I'm proud to say. And what they do are um, presentations that the students work on just at school. And I think this is important to kind of follow up with the equity piece that, you know, sometimes when there's opportunities for some kids to do projects at home and some at school, you know, you can kind of tell when they come to school that they don't all look maybe the same. And so all of the students are working on the projects in school. And this year's theme was uh, weather in the storm. So we have three sections and each section took a different type of storm. So they did floods, blizzards, and hurricanes. And so the students worked in small groups, um, worked on the design of their projects, they tested their projects. So they used fans to simulate the hurricane and books to the wait for the, uh, for the blizzards and of course lots of water for the floods and so the kids really learn a lot they have that opportunity to present at the science fair um, the rebuilding process and, um, and this year I'm happy to say they won the founders board um, again so it's a great great opportunity for our, our students to do that wow and I, I don't know what adjectives for, for, for Mr. Paul <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. You're great. I'm, uh, I'm very sad. This district is so awesome. There's so much fun on here. It's amazing. And um, and so, yeah, uh, after 36 years, I am finishing up my career uh, in June. And uh, it makes me happy. It's kind of boo-hoo-yahoo. Um, 
you should say that in kindergarten to the parents who we got fired. There's just so much going on. And I've only been here for a short period of time, and I've seen so much. Um, so many uh, opportunities for kids, so many opportunities for kids and adults, but you know, so much for, for the students. So um, I do want to take this opportunity to thank you, uh, Dr. Dura. You're and the whole administrative team. I know this is about me. I will make a little bit. <laughs> the amazing team, you and the school committee. Some folks are new that I haven't met before, but here when I came on board three years ago. Um, but the staff, students, families of East Nama, um, we're really making the last few years of the most amazing of my career. So I really appreciate that. So, Alan, you talked a little bit about uh, planting seeds, right? In your most eloquent, wicked smile um, <laughs> uh, speech. And so I'm just going to talk briefly. I mean, Hui is, I mean, I took a course years ago in uh, the politics of developing nations. And we talk about comparative advantage as a term. It's really an economic term, but when I think about it in this district, I think about the comparative advantages or advantage that this district has compared to other places that don't have, you know, um, the world leading independent nonprofit organization dedicated to ocean research, exploration, and education in their backyard. I mean, either we're in their backyard or, or you know, they're in our backyard, either way. Um, scientists, engineers push the boundaries. I mean, I just got this from Siri. Uh, <laughs> not only did the ocean reveal its impact on the planet and our lives, right? I mean, it's amazing. It's a, and I'm from the western part of the state. So we've got lots of stuff, uh, stuff going out there. You know, the Air Carl Museum's in my backyard, which is awesome. But I don't have the ocean in my backyard. And I don't have, you know, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in our backyard. And so that's the comparative advantage I speak of, that these students have the unbelievable opportunities and exposure uh, to. And so um, I'm going to, Tom probably knows this. Tom, do you know what Woods Hole is named for? Because you're a senior. You know, you're an ocean guy. Does anybody know what it is? Stay with the All right. It refers to the strait called Woods Hole. Which separates Kenny Cross and the Wizard of Fires, just so you know that. Um, so, Great Breeze Field Trip, which was a recent field trip. Um, they went down to, uh, they started out at the uh, Marine Biological Laboratory, Marine Resources Center, and they observed many different types of creatures. I was down in my first year. We, we went with all the teachers. That was We did a lot of the same things. It's a lot of the same places. Um, and my daughter actually wrote, uh, she was able to, she's in high school uh, in another district, and she did a fellowship for girls in science. She wrote uh, her application and she guided us last year and it was the most amazing experience. I know once again talk about my family, but um, I mean she was out in the field with researchers from with so you don't you know you don't get those opportunities. Um and she had a week there and it was just absolutely amazing. Um anyway so they went to many different types of they saw different creatures, octopus, uh, octopi, horseshoe crabs, etc. And then they fed some uh bright bass. These are our kids that were in the pond. And they discussed more about uh, learning more about habitats and, uh, and adaptations. And then they went over to the Discovery Center, which is another part where they explored um, and went into uh, uh, learned about vessels, vehicles, tools developed by who is to explore the ocean, including um, they did an exploration of the Titanic, learned about the plate of North, uh, North Atlantic right whales, studied the ocean twilight zone. I remember when the scientists talked about that twilight zone in the ocean where where uh, largest migration of, on Earth happens every day. It's just, kind of, just mind-boggling stuff. Um, they went to the Lima, or saw and touched the Lima Shark Dam, which is a vehicle used to observe, underwater vehicle used for, uh, to observe great white sharks in the natural habitat. And then um, I remember we climbed inside the um, replica of the Alvin, the submersible, to see what it was like to kind of be on the ocean floor. So all very cool stuff. And then they went to a touch tank and they touched scallops, spider crabs, lobster, more, more creatures. And then they finished up the aquarium and uh, explored more stuff. And then uh, after lunch, uh, they had, uh, I mean, they had lunch at the town playground and then back to school. So Mr. Manchester, Matt Manchester, Matthew Manchester and Kate Scahill, the third grade teachers who are absolutely amazing. Matt actually lived in, lived in the village for years 
Um, so he really knew his way around. So they didn't need a guide. They just, you know, they guided themselves. Um, they're just so into that whole relationship with Woods Hole. This third grade teacher does the whole district did. And um, it was just an amazing experience. And um, I just can't, you know, imagine a different, better place to be in the field with like the world's greatest marine biological scientists and research researchers and our kids get to interact with those resources and the, you know whether or not they all become scientists that's not the important thing but they're getting that exposure and it plants a seed and then who knows where it goes from there so just amazing and i'm going to turn it over now to the infamous um Principal of Moist Pond, Mr. Timothy Adams. So, the highlight of Moist Pond for the Woods Hole Partnership uh, for me this year was their grade six trip to Pennington's Island. I've never been there. Um, typically, as a principal, all you get involved with really is the planning part. You get to watch the buses come from your school in the morning. And then they come back later with all these stories to tell, and you weren't part of any of it. <laughs> Painting in the budget side of it. So the kids no longer being in the classroom, you miss that whole component of the field of this year. <laughs> and this particular trip is restricted because the number of people that actually fit on the boat to go to Panicky's. Well, we had someone who was unable to chaperone, so I very unselfishly said, hey, they would take their spot and making sure the children don't miss out on their opportunity to go there. Okay? Um, and then I get to see what the trip's all about. So you know, we leave from Woods Hole, and as we're on the bus, and this kind of goes back to our first goal of equity, um, just thought on me in the moment to say to the kids on the school bus, how many of you have never been on a boat before? And about six, if I remember correctly, six or seven years ago. And these are children who live on Cape Cod. So you think about equity and opportunity for experiences that some of us took for granted growing up, that we did a lot of. They had yet to go on a boat, very small boat otherwise. And there were some who were really nervous about it what's it going to be like and so this was brand new for them so already you kind of start off in a really special place and so this the trip takes you all along you the island we get to look at maps on our way out there to see where part of the coastline and the questions are just flying and what's that what's that do people live out there um because it's like it's like another planet when you go near no show and on your way out and so you head off of there up to Cuddy Hunk and we get to the island and get to do a whole lot of activity in a relatively short amount of time and learn about the ecology on the shoreline. And then we also take a tour of the island and learn about the history that there is a deep history through a very small chunk of land from being a research center, um, a leopard colony, a school for boys. Um, I just remember one of the kids who get to the highest peak of the island and you could look in one direction and see the Newport Bridge. And then look in the other direction and see the railroad bridge for Cape Cod, and then you ventured off on one side. And I thought, you know, this was one of our special education teachers. And I thought, how many kids in their lifetime are going to stand here and see that? Mm -hmm. um, because it's not open to the public. So, I mean, many, even if you own it, you're not going to see that. And our kids got to see that, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. and, and so the trip back to was an experience. They got to experience rough water. And some kids have never been in shop like that before. And, um, one boy in particular in the back was getting drenched. <laughs> Young man from Brazil, he's new to us last year. And I said, Do you want to move? Said, no. <laughs> this is a rat from the salt. <laughs> and um, but as we were talking, he just all he said was, That was the best day ever. Oh. And, you know, that makes it, all the science we learned, all the history we learned, everything we get to experience. Like, that's what a partnership like this can do for a child's life. They will remember that trip mm -hmm. as relatively short as it was through years, maybe for the rest of their life. So, we learned a lot of science, we learned a lot of history, and we had a great time. And that group bonded too. So, some of these experiences bring a group of kids together in a way that's maybe not quite as possible in the classroom, or I think it enhances the classroom community. So, that was a highlight for us in North Park this year for the Lizzo Partnership. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Woodward. Well, just uh, the ever growing importance of school safety. Um, and across the district, our commitment was to stay partner schools to ensure the physical safety of our schools and campuses through the employment of district-wide machines, policies, and systems. 
as well as the emotional and psychological safety that we experience during any type of crisis or management situations. In emergency management situations. Uh, our school safety goals set high expectations for student behaviors. And as I said, through that established district routine, uh, policies and systems, and we want we um, really want to make sure that we're fostering safe and supportive school environments, preventing and addressing bullying and other safety triggers. Additionally, we regularly check for the implicit bias in any and all of our school behavior decisions, procedures, and we provide training for our administrators to ensure that we're not meeting these expectations. Uh, throughout the school year, our area of concentration included. Uh, enhanced community, excuse me, enhanced current security measures such as SOP, cameras, routines, protocols, uh, restore regular staff and student training in Atlas and reunification drills, reinforce staff use of navigate, increase police presence in our schools, and increase safety and security staff across all of our schools. Uh, so now I'd like to turn it over to our Keith here. For C. Farron, Dr. Sonatelia, who will highlight some of the examples of the local safety security. Thank you, Dr. Gregory. So, we're looking at our student safety, and hopefully, uh, just some of the samples from the list. I think one that stands out is the recent presentation of the Hope Squad from students and staff at Fountain Play School. Mm -hmm. And we have Dr. Harris, who is the Hope Squad teacher here with us this evening. Uh, and definitely the prioritization around uh, services and support for our students from our counseling staff. Uh, collaboration uh, among our schools to the district wide health and safety committee added fob access points in our schools for additional um, entries uh, from around our school campuses. And most recently, uh, the publication of our updated bullying prevention policy and guidance. And so just uh, really quickly to speak to some of the work that's ongoing at North Fountain Elementary School, uh, Principal Vieira had wanted to share that at all staff meetings, uh, staff is practicing use of the Navigate Prepared app and helping uh, to build exposure and confidence with using the app and reporting uh, information and access and having different people practice setting the drills uh, <clears throat> into motion. Uh, and as they're doing that, running through various safety protocols and procedures, uh, adding the FOBs and additional entries and exits outside of the school so staff can enter from various parts of the campus, not just at the front and the side entrance, which is where they're originally placed. Uh, and just building, again, that routine and consistency so that they can respond to various scenarios as they occur. Uh, now I would like to introduce I'm Jersey on. I was there on your graduation. Uh, welcome. I don't know. Welcome to see everyone. Um, so it's not exciting maybe to report out on uh, school safety scenarios and uh, work, uh, but you get to ensure that with the safety, you can hear all the wonderful stories about the instructional practices that are going on the other goal. So um, I am here to showcase or spotlight the work of the school monitors. And at Lawrence School, uh, I've got uh, Mr. Frank Zaccarello, who I believe is an exemplar, but my understanding is the other uh, safety monitors are also working effectively and uh, positively with each individual school. Uh, so at Lawrence School, uh, our safety monitor carries out regular essential safety routines that you would expect, checking doorways in the morning, making sure that everything is closed properly and locked up tight. Uh, ongoing uh, viewing of the video cameras, interior and exterior, make sure that everything is running uh, smoothly and safely, and uh, a visible presence where students are, are gathered, larger number of students, possibly in unstructured situations, uh, or at the door to uh, welcome uh, and greet our regular guests, whether it be family members or uh, community partners that are coming and going to the school. Uh, we also make sure that our safety monitor is uh, routinely uh, reflecting on our emergency 
uh, response work. Uh, part, part of that is making sure the staff members are up to date with the Navigate Prepared app, which Dr. Keller has mentioned, uh, and attending health and safety meetings routinely to be apprised of things that the district might be wanting us to work on. Uh, and then, uh, of course, sharing their insights about what you know what we can do to continue to keep students and staff safe uh, around Alice practices and whatnot. Uh, in our case, uh, uh, Frank works closely with the admin team and uh, members of the health and safety team to come up with some innovative ideas that maybe we haven't thought of to keep the uh, keep the students and staff safe. And in this case, uh, my notes are on uh, one of the color coded. Uh, emergency response script packets that uh, he's distributed to staff and uh, other schools will begin to look at adopting the similar practice. Uh, this is an easy way to know what something is, to grab and instruct the situation, be able to go right to a script and have it right there to eliminate the, you know, having to rely on uh, what we've committed to memory or a giant binder in an emergency situation. Uh, I will say one of the important things that uh, important thing for my school team uh, and school community is that our safety monitor works to build relationships with students and staff, and we've been effective in that. Uh, I, I I like to call attention to, specifically to our safety monitor's commitment to again being in places where large student populations are. And every day, even in February, when the kids go outside for the last 15 minutes of lunch, he's out there with his scarf and his hat, making sure that uh, you know students who might be in a more vulnerable situation than in the school building uh, have an adult keeping an eye on them and making sure that they're safe. And not just keeping an eye on the kids, but keeping an eye on the surroundings uh, to look for something that might be out of the ordinary, potentially dangerous. And uh, our safety monitor was was rewarded and recognized for his relationship building during No Duck Week when he was uh, voted as our staff, our faculty and staff No Duck Award recipient uh, for just creating a positive atmosphere and a safe atmosphere for our students and staff at the law school. And at this time, I'm happy to take it back over to the. I'm going to use one of the school's model. Uh, Compassionate and responsible. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, wrapping things up, you know, full circle, we're going to finish up with bathrooms. <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I one of the, I have to say, there's this moment where two kids stop you in the hallway, say, Dr. Harry, we need, we need to talk. Okay, let's, let's go ahead and do it. <laughs> so we come in and two seniors and they look at me and they just say, we just think we can do better. I said, tell them about that. We just, we can do better with what happens in our bathrooms and what we do and we want to be a part of it. So, all right, well, let's talk about a plan. So, you're familiar with Katie Shanahan, one of our seniors. She already had a, she had a four point that she had already shared with me that morning. And it included uh, vape detectors, but that was one small part of a larger plan that said, seniors talking with the rest of the students about what it should look like to be your best. Mm -hmm. Developing a plan to talk to students at Lawrence School about the dangers of vaping and addiction. Working with teachers on doing a better job of holding students in class at the start. And you know, I've, I've done this more than a year or two, and, and it is uh, always refreshing when student voice comes out. I'm a big believer in Margaret Mead's, you know, I never underestimate the potential of a small group of people to change the world affects what they ever has. And, and I believe that happens with students and teachers. What I found out well after that was the students that I actually talked to Mr. Feeney and said, Mr. Feeney, what should we do? And it was Mr. Feeney who said, talk to Mr. Harris and listen. And so it's that connection of students to teachers. The safest schools in America are the ones where there's a relationship between kids and adults, and they tell the adults in the problem, the problem. like Hope Squad, 
like that piece and the investment in those adults in, in family is it, it's just it's just tremendous and for us as our kind of culture of working as a school you know it it became and and i've never been anywhere where you meet with your superintendent in late november and say i think we'd like to get baker tech and some other things in and literally it's paid for ordered and installed in january I mean, that just doesn't happen in other districts. It's just, you know, and so with that, then our assistant principals, Ms. McManaman and Ms. Morath, who is tremendous, they're meeting with kids working on a plan. They're also meeting with teachers working on the adjustment that's going to happen. We do meetings. The students who led this piece were part with class meetings of each class, right, the sophomore, junior, seniors, actually in the dialogue with Ms. Morath and Ms. McManaman about the change that was coming and forecasting that. And and I think you know we always said this is this we're not trying to hunt kids down and catch them vaping. We're trying to discourage vaping in our schools and to we had a bad habit of bathrooms have become a gathering place, and that's not a gathering place. And we need you to get to, we want you to come to school, go to class, and do your work. And let's get back to that. And that collective way of solving a problem is what became the culture. And and in uh, true uh, Katie Shanahan fashion in May with Ms. Marathas uh, and working with uh, Mr. Bushy, they went to Lawrence and led eighth graders in a lesson on um, on, on, on and the dangers of it. And so to see kids check every box on the list, you know, and see that through and then, and then begin to see that change and, and just what that sets up in terms of how you dialogue and you think about a school, for me, was, uh, was a big win, as we say. Uh, just the way we're better than anything else. So, with that, one moment. <laughs> so, I got to tell you this uh, extraordinary team. Uh, literally just did a four hour presentation in an hour. And I'm excited about that. <laughs> but uh, I think uh, one of the things I, is that you hear reading through, you hear these amazing stories of having at each school. Uh, and they happen throughout the, the school district. And I think one of the things that uh, bringing uh, all the goals together as district-wide goals, like we can do so much more together than we can as individual schools. And so the excellence, uh, we learn from one another, we support one another. Um, and another amazing thing uh, from uh, this team is that when we created the, the charting the course um, to a graduate, you can see what became very important, not only for the adults, but the staff, and that is around the diversity, the social emotional learning, uh, and our community. And so our goals really reflect uh, what we believe uh, that our, our entire school community um, should value. So with that, thank you very much for listening, and uh, thank you. Does anyone have any questions before you want to No, you can't. You can't. Yeah, but... That's this is the best presentation in 15 years. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. See all the yeah. adjectives. <laughs> best pile of best words in the not up to your pardon. <laughs> 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 I ask a question to you, you, you three gentlemen. At the high school, talking about the parents, the high school, does every bathroom have a bait detector or not? Every student bathroom has a bait detector. Okay. Yes. Mr. Bushy? Uh, yes, the student bathrooms have, have uh, each have a bait detector, not the community bathrooms. The student bathrooms. That's, that's the same thing with us. Our, our community bathroom is a single bathroom does not have. It's the I'm just sure. yes, yeah, the yeah. only second floor, first floor, <laughs> floor, so the six each, yeah. Mr. Adams at Morris Pond, do you have any bait detectors? We do not. Okay, so I don't know what age kids start vaping and doing what, but I would we should look into getting bait detectors at the fifth and sixth grade school, if not the elementary schools, because you know. If the kids start, so that's, just, that, that's my only point on that. Um, but I just want to make sure that the bathroom. And I just, I, I do want to be, I mean, from the moment I was started in mid July as principal, mm -hmm. I had in August and September multiple parents 
visit me and say, we really should put in big protectors. Big protectors. Big protectors. And I have friends who are principals in Wisconsin and California and others, and, and, and it called them, and, and their tenant was used or whatever. I, and my point is, in sharing this is, like a lot of things in schools, it's not the big protector. The big protector is one part of a comprehensive, and that's what was really touching to me was, Katie Shanahan came in and said big detectors as part of a plan we're all going to work on together. And so I don't disagree that they can be helpful at whatever level you're at, but it's really, I think what we try to do at the high school is start the conversation of what does it look like to have meaningful conversation about the issues of, of vacancy, more importantly, how we, you know, comport ourselves as, you know, as scholars, you know, rigor, respect, and responsibility on a daily basis and what that looks like. And have that conversation. I just don't, sometimes when, People talk about baby tech, it's like it is part of the bigger piece. Then the only reason I ask is that I have anecdotal stories yeah. from people who have students who've not used the bathroom all day. Uh -huh. They were in that particular bathroom, uh -huh. which might have been, you know, yeah. last year. Um, but I do think that the baby <laughs> detectors, even in Morse Pond, would be beneficial. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Anyone else? Question. Um, Superb presentation, um, a lot of fun, um, a lot of really good information. And I have to say, I love uh, just the, the little mention um, in the partnership work of not just focusing on the scientists, but also all of the other amazing careers that make science possible, because there's so much um, all the way to you know, finance and accounting and, and HR. Um, my question uh, kind of go, maybe spans goals one and three. And it's the, the trade-off between um, physical and psychological safety. And the two highlights that you shared were examples, and I wholeheartedly, Frank is incredible. Um, and I hear incredible things about him from my Lawrence School um, student and um, students stepping up to make their own school safer. And yet one of the, the goals and action items is a stronger police presence. And so I'm, I'm just curious about the thinking about that balance of putting police officers who, for a lot of our students from marginalized and disadvantaged backgrounds, are not going to feel safe versus other staff and other measures um, in place to, to increase safety in a way that doesn't have that same trade off. And I'll say quick the, the, the relational component in place with yeah. our SRO, and then in addition to that, the way in which he connects other officers who would be at, at games or supervision is, is, is true. I mean, I, I have not been in a school where students who can be from a traditionally marginalized group come running up to start the day to hug the police officer. I mean, the, the, it, I agree that the presence can be, you know, it can be an asset when there's that relational piece. And I think the work that police here have done and having an SRO at our school for a Chunk of time building that relationship and building invested in kids has been has been a true difference maker in that regard. Yeah, I was thinking that 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 word presence, please present, would that that kind of shocked me as well. But but I, I know Officer Brand and I've talked to him and uh, you know I'll be in an office with him and all of a sudden someone will come in his office, marginalized will come in his office asking a non police, not everything. They're like, hey, we're looking for this, and the the relationship that was built by him was. Is amazing, and that's what I asked for with the research officer. Really, that relational piece. You know, um, the other stuff is is for the emergency when we hope we never get. But be that relationship, be that uh, resource for students. I think for a long time, we, you know, as the system principal passed, uh, if there was anything problems outside, it's bring them in, saying, "Hey, this is a resource for you. This is a resource." So, but we have to be mindful. We absolutely have to be mindful because it does. Presidents, you know, they don't know the first time we'll, we'll have to have that discussion. So thank you for bringing that up. Can I just comment on the SRO thing? My opinion, and opinion of many parents, is that we should have more SROs in school for the situation which we've had several this year. Um, I feel like bank robbery, the Cape is a new big thing. So that's happening. The school has been locked down several times. Um, the safety monitors are all great people, but in those situations, what can they do? And we've talked about having more police presence for the safety of everyone. 
Um, and I've worked with other schools where the SROs, the students of marginalized communities or not will talk to the SROs if there's a problem at all. Mm -hmm. It's another layer of you know, teacher administration, bus driver, friends, and not every student connects with every single person. So I think that um, more police presence in our school for the safety of everyone, um, when you get quality officers like Officer Grant before that, um, you know, the officer hurt, mm -hmm. hurt yeah, but yes, I mean, um, both fantastic people. I think, you know, you know when, when Cliff was around, I see Jamie all the time doing stuff and there's a connection there. And I think that it's important to have the police in the school, even with kids at a younger age, to make those connections. So that way, when they get older, they know they have someone that they can, you know, yeah. rely on. Thank you. Margaret, I have a couple of comments and questions. Um, first of all, you know, there's something like role modeling, and this was an outstanding presentation, but also the collegiality among you. So we're a spirit, and that's wonderful role modeling for our students. And that's very impressive, but I, I have to mention that. Uh, um, okay, uh, next, you mentioned that the bathrooms were gathering places. So the question is, are there gathering places for students? There are, we still want them gathering during class. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, no, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 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 you know, I'm very impressed. I mean, yes, we're a wonderful location and STEM and all these wonderful things. And actually, if our students move into STEM, they'll make better salaries. But I was at a talk in India with a um, writer for the um, New Yorker, when Mindy taught him, he had um, a discussion. And one of the things that brought up is the humanities has somehow taken a back seat. So I just want to mention that it's really, I, I doubt this is happening, but I do want to alert people, you know, that there are a lot of organizations that are um, um, involved in humanities, and I encourage more of that coming from the social science and the humanities background. And one thing about STEM, when you're talking about the fair, were you talking about the fair at the uh, high school? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I'm going to make a comment about it. I attended, those students just wanted to talk about their projects. You could not do that in two hours. No, I mean, you know, I, I talked with a few of them. They're excited about what they did. They wanted to communicate that. All of those kids wanted to do that. And two hours, doesn't let that happen. And I don't know why it's two hours long, but I would just mention that for the sake of the students, it really should be more. Mm -hmm. So they can really display what they've done. It's incredible, absolutely incredible. And uh, that's all. Anyone else? I have a few comments. Uh, Dr. Harris, <clears throat> you spoke about the student advocating for themselves to get into the AP class. I love that the high school and uh, hopefully all of our schools foster that relationship with leadership. Like everyone has a bad day. Everyone has a bad year. Not every day is your best day, but I love that the student has enough confidence to say to their instructor, you know what? I, I had a stumble. I had a, a thing, but I please give me a chance, please. And I think that um, using that as a teaching moment, not just for our teachers and our instructors, but as that student moves on in life to whatever professional person they wanna be, they're gonna remember that. And then when somebody comes to them and says, you know what, I made a mistake, um, or I'm looking for forgiveness, or I'm looking for, could. Could you help me? I I just I stumbled. Can you help me? I think that that is what I am really proud of. And among other things, I'm mean, proud of a lot of things. I want to say a few more things, but like I that piece in and of itself, I love that um, we have that sort of. I love that part. Um, also, Dr. Tellier, the third grade, the picture of the third grade students. I hope that photo went to the family. <laughs> uh, Mr. Goodheim, thank you for coming to Talma. Thank you for being at my East Falmouth School. Thank you for um, 
fostering an amazing uh, learning experience for the students there. I still have a hand, uh, not so much like even before, but uh, I'm still involved where I can be at least. And I love that you were there and I appreciate you and thanks for coming. And I know that it wasn't always easy, um, but I thank you and we're better to have you. So I appreciate you and I wish you best of luck and you're at retirement. Thank you. Um, Dr. Harris, I love that the students are back to you. <laughs> that came to you for the planning of the, you know, how are we going to take care of the vape and the how the the uh, vape detectors were really just a piece of the bigger um, bubble of it all. I I appreciate um, not just Katie but the other students. I appreciate them recognizing that it is it's it's not just to detect the vape to tell them to stop, you know, putting toxin in their body. But why are we doing this? How can we prevent it? It's not just like, don't, you know, don't look in school. It's not just about that. It's about so much more and all the other things. And again, back to the relationships. Um, and speaking of relationships, I know that um, if we look at having a um, more police officers or, uh, I, I see both sides of it. I think that there are folks that are intimidated by having police officers in school. Um, and then there are people that love having them in school. And if we look at our um, SROs and if, if John goes in the way of having more police presence in schools, I'd like to not use the word presence, but I'd really like to use the word relationship because it's truly a relationship. And um, I forgive me, I forget who said it, not every kid connects with their assigned uh, homeroom teacher. And if that is the person, um, and I'm thinking specifically of Officer Farrell, um, she has connected with thousands of people in this town. And I think that it started um, where at least it, you know, grew from when she was um, in the DARE program, which I think was the beginning of the SRO program. But anyway, that's it. And go team Clippers. And you guys were amazing. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Um, so the first, uh, I'm looking at it on my computer. I believe you all have the handouts with the highlighted. Mm -hmm. The first piece, the police of liability, that actually comes as a recommendation from legal counsel for the Mass Association of School Superintendents. And it's, uh, we've always had our release, um, a, a consent and release form. We didn't have uh, language actually added to the handbook about the purpose of it. So this is language that is specifically recommended by that legal counsel. And the purpose of it is there's been a rise in uh, recent years of uh, hazing, bullying, discrimination behaviors, particularly in extracurricular activities at school, particularly at the high school level. And as a result of that, school districts have also been sued for so-called management supervision. And we all know that things can happen. We have wonderful supervision, I know, at Dallas High School and at, North, at all the schools when we have extracurricular activities. But things do happen, and adults don't always see it or hear about it, and, and things take place. So it's recommended to, for two reasons. Number one, to include negligent supervision in the release of liability. It doesn't release intentional conduct or gross negligence, which is an extreme departure from the ordinary standard of care that teachers or, or supervisors are held to. So that, that's not released by this release. But it does, you know, everyday garden variety negligence, but it also very specifically points to the fact that makes very clear that the students will not be, it will not be tolerated to have students engage in bullying, hazing, harassment, and discrimination. So it just puts it right out there. In concert with that, um, there is 
a we have this consent and release form in our forms packet that we send to students at the beginning of the school year when they participate in extracurricular activities. This is being recommended to be revised to mirror the uh, negative supervision language. And also this is language again that was recommended by legal counsel for the Mass Association of School Superintendents this past, um, this past fall. Uh, there are two releases here. One, because at the high school level, we do have some students who are 18. So we haven't in the past had a release for 18 year olds. I would still recommend that parents sign one, but there have been cases where if the parent has signed a release and the student is 18, the release is not effective. So it's uh, it's advisable to have a release for 18 year olds. So that's the first part of the handbook. And all of this is found in the policy subcommittee. So that's it's for a first read with the whole school together. The second section is uh, in our student handbook. We have Appendix C, student discipline. And the school committee's um, purview with handbooks is really focused on ensuring that the handbooks comply with the school committee's policies. And the school committee's policies in turn must comply with applicable law. So because we know that the student discipline statute just recently changed, we have to update our handbook to reflect that change. We, at the last meeting, we voted on the student discipline policy that was updated to reflect the new change in the statute. And this is just the same, pretty much the same language, but for purposes of including it in the handbook. Hmm. The third section, um, our purpose section required some changing. It never mentions that Massachusetts has our own student record regulations. And that's important because even FERPA provides that if a state has their own uh, student record regulations that conflict with FERPA, the state um, overrides and apply. So the first paragraph really just talks about our student information, record information is controlled by FERPA as well as the Massachusetts student record regulations. What's in black print is what we already have in our policy. Then there's an addition of just describing what the Massachusetts student records regulations provide. And then one thing that we needed to include, which we hadn't had in the handbook, and this came up because we got a request from, it's called a third party mail house. And they are, it's an organization that, um, our partnership that, for example, charter schools use to the third party mail house does their mailings for them. If you think about like supermarket flyers, you know how a supermarket uses an organization to put together their flyers and mail them out. Well, I don't even know if they mail out flyers anymore, but whatever. In any event, in the old days, they mailed out their flyers for inserts, you know, to the Boston World Sunday Globe, and you've got your supermarket flyer. That's what a third party mail house is essentially for uh, charter schools. And the, the charter school says, we need the names and addresses of all eligible students in the district who might be uh, able to enroll in our school next year. It's, it's recruiting purposes, essentially. But we have, we're have required by law to include a notice to parents and guardians that we will provide in directory information to these third party mail houses unless you opt out and do not want to do that. And what happened was we got a letter from Sturgis saying, uh, we are, please send uh, all of this directory information to this third party mail house. It's an approved third party mail house from Desi. I looked in the handbook and realized, oh, we don't have that in our handbook. So we actually sent out a letter that explained third party mail houses to all eligible students. And we only had one parent actually call to opt out, but it should be in the handbook. So currently, you need to have the parents written permission to send it out, and this policy would no, you don't need the parents written permission. It's truly right. really an opt out law, no, so opt you have to, yes, just for these things, a the dozen or so things, and uh, yes, yeah, okay. Then we had our, our drugs, alcohol, baby, and tobacco use uh language, it didn't have vaping in it before. I thought it was important just to include vaping there. And the only other change is 
It was a little outdated, but the way we said holding a lighted cigarette is considered smoking. <laughs> a staff member may report in writing a student using tobacco without personally confronting the student. Uh, that language was just unnecessary, we thought. And kids now vape and they are not lighting up cigarettes in the bathrooms anymore. This last piece is actually not really policy, but it was a, a notable um, deletion from the high school handbook. The Mr. Feeney, we heard a lot about this year. Um, he is changing up how student government will operate at the high school. And some of the things even that were in here were outdated and not followed. So this doesn't even need to be in the handbook. So we just want to point out to you that this you will no longer see what's in the handbook. What else? Yeah. Questions? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, you know, I was like reading with the pontoon comb. So, apologies in advance. I think it's any truth that you're going to be on policy. Okay, so I just want to confirm that the first, I'm um, starting at the beginning. So, release of liability. So, the first section, the two paragraphs, that will be in the handbook. Yes. And then everything after that is going to be the forms that come in the packet. Correct. So, the, the concern that I have, um, and it might even be something not just for this one section, but uh, maybe even more generally for the rest of the handbook, is that the the literacy level for this section is very high. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm worried that, to the point that maybe families might not understand what exactly they're reading. Um, and I don't know if we can, if it's important to take the exact language, could we almost have like the, you know, the one like what like when you go to the doctor and they say and this form is for the blah 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 you know the one sentence summary or if we can somehow make it a little bit more um like conditions on compliance with all applicable laws like that's rough for, for people to understand um so that's my concern about about that one piece i don't know if we can do anything about it but um and then can I just move? Oh, yeah. Hold on. I don't know. Unfortunately, the lease language really does need to be specific yeah. and uh, unfortunately be the lease because that's the that 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 for language. the forms. But the, the paragraphs in the handbook that preceded have to be legalese as well. Well, yes, essentially. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I, so this came really directly also from legal counsel for the Mass Social School Superintendents. I've talked to some other lawyers and there. This is the language that is agreed upon. Okay. Um, and, and I think because if, you, if you're not as detailed and specific, and, and I, I totally agree with you. If I read, if I read this and, you know, it's, it's a lot. It's even, it's a lot for us to read, you right. know, to, to right. understand it. Um, okay, so, um, and then the, I think the only, I think you actually touched on all the other things I had. Um, except for in the Massachusetts Student Records Regulation, mm -hmm. the first line set ends with "are intended to ensure ensure." Yeah, just that. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I think I'm not sure. I think I'm sure. But I think you answered all my other ones. So thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, I'm back on the, the release of liability as well. Um, how is this well, go back to literacy level? Um, how is this level of liability different than the le level of liability that the school holds? during the school day or say during a field trip? And are we required in the handbook to say, to go on a field trip, you'll have to sign a release of liability or to do enough, you know, this this is, is kind of beyond the actual having to sign the release, the, the announcement of it feels different. Yeah, I think it's because most of the litigation has come out of these extracurricular activities and uh, you know, a school is liable <laughs> for conduct, regardless of whether we're saying, you know, there's a release. I think the intention with this is because of hazing and bullying, the incidents that have really arisen. Um, this is trying to point out specifically that that is not allowed. 
you know, you don't get so much hazing going in on a field trip or during the school day. It's not, it's just, it's just a different extracurricular activities pose a different set of problems because of the supervisory nature. You know, you, you could have, you, you don't have as many adults per students as you do during a classroom or a field trip. Yeah. Say. No, I guess that's an interesting framing of it, that, it's, that the point, and maybe to go back, Kelly, to your point about like a, a plain language, what's the point of this? section because when I read this I I get the exact opposite mm -hmm. message not that this is to hold students accountable but it sends a message of your kids on their own when they do this mm -hmm. um and and even to the language in the release that it's you know agree to forever release blah blah blah, blah hold harmless town found with school committee found with public schools employees blah 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 and any and all individuals and organizations in as this thing are participating in, which I would read as the other students involved, everyone involved, and it, it feels like a um an abdication of that that standard of that's not allowed. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean I know it's stipulated legal language, but maybe for understanding what the intent of this is has to make that um, I can try to add, I can try to come up with a a, a little this the reason for this is. Because I think it's first up that we want to agree, which might solve. I don't know, it'll be at a policy meeting if we approve me and I put my money where I mean, I have a sense of honesty because I think that can limit it. And I, I'm more inclined to go with the language that has been recommended by the Mass Association School Superintendent because it's, it's they've had their issues, they've seen cases, and they feel that this is the best language to address it. And I wouldn't want to limit it. I wouldn't want to have my language then limit something that has been set up to protect the school district mm -hmm. in certain circumstances. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. I'd like to move on to the first reading of the school committee meeting schedule for 23 24. Uh, you have your calendar in your packet. Does anyone have any questions, comments, concerns? Ellie? Uh, so as I had mentioned to you, I was going to look up the date for town meeting, uh, which I found. So for the Monday, November, it's November 13th. Thank you. And for the new people who are joining us on school committee, if you are not town meeting members, uh, the week of town meeting, whether it is in November or April, our school committee meeting is on the Monday of town meeting week. And we meet at the six. library at the lunch school. It's a hike, so bring your sneaks. The hike up there. Um, any other comments, edits, anyone sees questions? <laughs> Sorry, hi. No, no, that's fine. I put it on the um, I was just curious in terms of meeting locations, are there other like venues, like in terms of other schools that would be able to accommodate um, kind of school committee meeting just in terms of accessibility for families who might want to join or participate? Right. Things are because they have to do it. Yeah. So we have uh, some data that in the past and tried it. It ended up becoming more limited in terms of the amount of people that could access it through the mm -hmm. Zoom and also watching on channel 14 who can the broadcast. Okay. Why why is that right? Oh, I'm sorry if I may. Please. Why is that right? Part of it was network access and being able to do that obviously with the Zoom cameras now it's a little bit different, but being able to have reliable um, broadcast locations is still a little problematic. It's the other buildings. But do we where we're at? I mean, we can I can investigate it and see, especially if we're talking probably in the libraries and the bigger rooms. I think a good example of our um sticky limitation was town meeting this past April when we were in the Lawrence Library and we had some IT trouble um it was frustrating i think for everyone involved so thank you 
That was yeah. nothing. It, it, yeah, we had a limited bad. time, and yeah. then we had we were short on time. Yeah. It was nothing good came of it, mm -hmm. unfortunately, and it was uh, an emotional meeting. Anyway, so um, yeah, we did try it one whole year. Um, we did. We, went we, yeah, we didn't find that the games outweighed the technical issues, and mm -hmm. yeah. because because we have, I mean, we broadcast live every. I think Zoom has made it easier. Yeah, and, and, yeah. For parents that want to, or not just parents, families that want to participate. For quite a while, um, we did fit every school. Um, and we incorporated in the agenda a presentation that a particular issue or not issue, but that presentation is. by the students. It brought out a lot of parents. Not that we could do that on a regular fit basis, but it might be nice to try to figure out occasionally. Um, it involves a lot of families. I totally forgot about those presentations. That was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. They were great. Yeah, one year we did do three schools. You remember? Yeah, not, not, yeah. yeah. For what Sue said. Yeah. Yep. And, and the other next year we did the next four. Or I think so. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? All right, we will vote on it uh, next time. Now, I'd like to ask on the memorandum of understanding for Unit D, and I'd like to turn that over to Dr. Durr. Hey, can you discuss um, the uh, memorandum of understanding? Um, so Dr. Woodward uh, had led the charge uh, with the nurses, and um, Sonia, uh, Dr. Tanya also. I hope not. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Woodward to give us a high level of um, the memorandum of understanding. Certainly. Um, so thank you. Uh, the work that we did, Dr. Tellier and I met with uh, the members of Unit D, our nurses, and on some of our few members. And um, this agreement really acknowledges that our the our nurses' educational and licensing requirements, um, as well as uh, how we earn kind of what we refer to as professional development um, points here in the district. Um, so it was developed to calibrate these requirements, as well as recognizing that nurses um, they do professional development and, and other activities that traditional teaching, and that's what we do here at Education or Professional Development Points. It was a calibration between the nurses' contact hours, um, continuing education units, and the professional development. Uh, points that we do, and it really was to make sure that we have alignment for our nurses with our medical to provide equity and access across the um, the salaries, lanes in the salary slips. So um, it does recognize um, that the uh, the trainings, the PD, and things like that do need to come from the National Association of School Nurses. Um, you know, there's there's criteria within there with those CEUs and contact hours and whatnot, and at how they would be granted. Um, I'm happy to answer any you know, specific questions you may have in that, but that's the that is the essence of what we've done is for that that alignment. All right. I'd like to make a motion to approve the memorandum of understanding for unit D. Is there a second? A second. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Any abstention? Excellent. Thank you. On behalf of the nurses. Uh, okay. Yes. Can you just put it? Yeah. Sure. The official selling. I'm happy to send it. I'm going to put R in after that. Just uh, she is signing the official MOA. Um, the FDA has already signed it and is waiting for the school committee vote. So it is official now. And uh, it was awesome. Thanks, Thank you. Nurses. Great. Yeah. I think our nurses will be very happy with this. Did they yes. ever sign R in outside the hospital? <laughs> <laughs> All right, now let's move into discussion of the subcommittee assignments. At your seat, you'll find the updates as of today, this afternoon, and I've heard from a few of you for some additional edits, which is fine. There's, I just want to remind everyone there is time to change, and we're not going to vote on this until 
June 27th. So if you would like to email me with any changes or any edits, please know you have time or if you have any questions um, between now and then, please don't hesitate to reach out to me by email or you can call me or text me or um, but however, however you want to meet and talk about it, it's fine with me. Okay. Can we edit now or? If you'd like to tell me, um, sure. Yeah, um, I did not ask for the learning advisory to know this year. That was from last year. So could you just take me off of that? Uh, help me. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay, yeah, sure. And could I add myself to the wellness committee? Yes, that was one of the things that you told me about. Absolutely, Terry. The reason for that is um, I looked at other school committees, um, subcommittees. I looked at Sandwich, Born, Barnes, <laughs> Bowling, Matthews to see what they do that we don't do. And um, like Barnes School had a special one when they had a new superintendent last year, they had a six month um, subcommittee to work with her entry plan. So, um, I mean, and they 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 have a, uh, I think it was an Ashby, or the only is on to the selection. So maybe I will retreat this summer. I'm mentioning that we can look and see do we need to keep them all year, for example, or can we add them or whatever. Anyway, so I went on and on, and I just I think this year, because of um, the bathing that's on the wall, I mean, I just think it's cool that we have more people. You know, making sure that that keeps on its roll. And I really think um, it's the question of health concerns for screening time is a national concern. I mean, it's come up and down. It. So maybe just having three people on the health issues for a while would be a help. So anyway, I'd like to add myself onto that. Okay. Thank you, Terry. Any other edits? Margaret, I have your, um, that we spoke of earlier, budget and... Diversity. Diversity, thank you so much. Uh, yes. I just have some questions. Go and um, perhaps now is the time to discuss them, perhaps at the retreat this summer. Sure. Um, I'm just wondering where some of the other subcommittees went. Sure. Um, and in particular, I'm wondering curriculum. Um, Technology Advisory Committee, and mm -hmm. I'm assuming the school councils are alive and well in mm -hmm. all of those schools. They, um, we had liaisons at one point for that. Um, in that regard, not that everyone wants to add more work to their duties, but I would appreciate the fact if we were to get brief reports from the school councils um, sure. after their meeting just so we can be aware of what the issues are at the various schools that they've uncovered. Sure. Well, there is a technology committee. I took on that last year. It has just changed. I mean, it's just changed. Okay. The department committee, but there's a very active committee. I'm going to give my report today. Okay. No, I'm sorry. I feel wrong. No, that's not fair. The curriculum one, um, we used to have a great right. Year, but mass general law said school committees made it immediately to a subcommittee. Yeah. It's not, it's, it's, not, it's not, it's not, they, yeah. they spoke, if you look at the law, it speaks to the curriculum part that it's not our purview. Okay. Um, so, we, we updated the uh, policy right. to reflect that. Yeah. yeah. That was my question. But that's okay. Um, like these other, one of the school committees I looked at, they stay at the curriculum. So maybe you can. I also think this is a good segue to remind the group that things come up along the way, mm -hmm. along the year. Um, and, you know, I know that everyone is, I love that everyone is super excited and wants to do more and more and more. But I'm sort of thinking of the whole year and thinking of things that we don't know about that are going to come down the pipe. And I just, I hope that we're not like spreading ourselves too thin. So I would just keep all of that in mind when you're um, before the 27th, if there's any edits you want to make. What? Mark, if last year we had, um, and uh, yeah. you, you said that they were, I was on the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion with mm -hmm. uh, 
Natalie and Andrea. And then there were two other committees. And then up here. So if you're referring to communication that came from a goal from our um, retreat last summer, and if communication is a school committee goal at our retreat this summer, I'm sure that we will have a assignment after that. I would call it a committee, but I would call it an assignment. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. Things that come up after the fact, whether it be at the retreat or if something comes up uh, in our school community, um, things come up. So um, communication is a, a great example of an assignment that came up. The, um, the uh, MASC conference is in November. Mm -hmm. And I've gone to a few. I'm trying to do this on some. Okay. Andrew was an officer last year for our oh, we're division good. seven. Yeah. So that is okay. that's I'm sorry, Margaret went to um, <laughs> maybe Sue did. Did you go on your day too? I think yeah, yeah. Um anyway, that's that's a commitment. It's like three days, but you don't have to go all three days, but um it's another commitment from November. You learn they have they, we learn yeah, it's really feminist. Yeah. Any Kelly? Um, so in regard to study and time, you can hear the yes. question. Yeah. Um, so um, the LPAC, yeah. Um, in our committee descriptions, we don't have um we don't have like a admin person who's the doesn't look, I don't know what the meeting schedule is, and I don't know who I should ask about the meeting schedule is. Do we have one administrator or teacher that usually Leads that charge. I can follow up and find out what my commitment to be. Once this is all approved, we we connect you with the leads of all this. But I might ask to be removed depending on the obligation because I'm already on four of those things. I don't know if I can handle it. So that is what is that? Maybe could actually speak for that. Okay. I was going to say if anybody wants to um, also show some. Uh, Interest in that, please. Don't oh, yeah. Or if somebody wants to share it with me, that'd be great too. I just don't know what the commitment is. Check. There's monthly meetings. There's monthly meetings, and usually it's in my office. And um, there are two parent uh, leaders that are involved in it. And uh, we try to figure out ways how do we get more parents to come to our general meeting, which is quarterly. Um, so it's not that much of a draw. And, and they're really liking these uh, tables where parents can come and, and, and have like three girls talking and having a, a, someone there um, listening to them and having um, translators on each table. So, so overall, like one meeting? One meeting a month. And then the quarterly. And then the third quarter. Anyway, what, what day and time? Sure. The, the, meeting the meetings are usually like um, weekdays uh, for Three or three or four, three or four, four. I can look it up. No, it's fine. I just wanted to go like at night. No, but then I think for the meetings um, are the parents at six thirty. Okay. Yes. So that's the one we we're trying to get parents to follow the beef. Yeah. The monthly no. Yeah, monthly certain of that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Because especially if it's during the day, that's really hard. Also, um, if I know that this looks like it's a completed worksheet, it's very much a worksheet in process until the 27th. So if there's anybody else that um, has interest in something, or like I said, has second thoughts, or what have you, just send me an email and um, I will add that to my other worksheet that I'm working on. Any other questions or comments? All right, good Moving on to the superintendent update. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we've heard from Mr. Goodman uh, tonight, and um, a couple more weeks, and he will be off on the retirement. Um, yesterday, we were fortunate to have um, uh, Ms. Kelsey Kelly, uh, our new principal uh, at He's Gone, um, joined us yesterday uh, during the day. We uh, visited um, all the classrooms that he uh, found, it, and we also visited uh, the two TIP teachers, uh, their classrooms with their students at T Ticket. Um, and then we had a meet and greet um, that um, uh, with a lot of staff, a few parents, a couple of uh, school committee members. Um, we appreciate that. And I think it was informal and an opportunity 
um, to get to hear a little bit uh, about uh, Kelty and get to know her. Um, so, so that was that was exciting, uh, which leads me into uh, just uh, formally uh, announcing that the two tip classrooms, preschool uh, tip classrooms, will be moving over to East so that all of the uh, preschool uh, are together. Um, and um, just uh, uh, we're really happy to have uh, Kelty uh, on board. Her background is preschool and special education, and it's a nice fit. It's a nice fit to have all together. Uh, so and that's why for the two teachers that are uh, moving from T Tech because it's a great school. But as soon as they're at East School, they're going to know that East is also a great school, and uh, they are being welcomed. And I think people are really excited um, to have all, everyone together and the opportunities that it's going to. Um, right for um, our tip uh, students as well. So um, I just uh, want to let you know, I know that we have talked about uh, several um, uh, positions um, like the CTE department head, the CTE, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, CVTE um, um, department head, sorry, and the, the um, library um, digital literacy computer science <laughs> um, department head. Um, Portuguese interpreter, um, the liaison, uh, family liaison, uh, and the welcome center. Um, and one of the reasons I said to you, like, I mean, these are positions that have been bumping up um, with different groups, and it's you know it's a need; it will remain a need. Um, but uh, we always wait till spring to kind of make those decisions. And at this point, um, we will not be able to add any of those positions to the budget um, for for next year. Um, and that's. You know, it's it's good for us to talk about it. It's good for them to be, um, you know, on, on the books to know that we're that's the goal. Um, but right now, um, in the last couple of months, uh, we are increasing our preschool uh, classroom by one teacher, potentially two. Uh, that will include also uh, teaching assistants. Uh, we just added an additional special education teacher. Uh, that's reviewed often, and that you know we always have to leave um, some openings for that to happen. That will be a continuation through next year. Um, we will need two ELD teach new ELD teachers. Uh, we've had about forty new students um, uh, come into the district, and we're trying to um, figure out the services. And we are adding one uh, speech and language pathologist. Um, basically, that's eight eight positions um, that we're count on, and it's a needs. And these are positions that we don't have a choice on um, because of the services we're required to um, offer our students. Uh, we are knowing, uh, noticing a um, not only um, the needs across the district, um, but particularly um, the preschool has really um, uh, been really great here recently and with the potential um, talking across the cake that seems to be everywhere. Um, so it is growing. Um, so I just wanted to kind of let you know, uh, we're kind of putting those other positions on hold. We're working out uh, ways of making sure that the needs are met continue through next year, uh, but we will continue it and possibly next year. Um, but we always say somewhere between one and three years, if it's a need, we'll be able to make it happen um, in the budget. So I guess I want to let you know that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, an opportunity um, that um, uh, because of uh, the communications um, uh, feedback that I received about wanting to improve, um, and I stated that I wanted to make it uh, my personal learning goal, uh, our communications and the, uh, the district wide, my, my district wide goal. Uh, is around communication. I reached out to um, Chris Horn, which many of you may know because you've attended the mass um, conferences and he presents every year several sessions uh, throughout the three days. So if you've been there, he's, he's presented um, for many years. And he has helped us out here in this district um, from time to time uh, when, when needed. But he is a, um, he, uh, he's, he's the managing partner of Horn Communications. And his uh, he is uh, most uh, uh, productive in uh, being proactive around marketing and communications. He does respond to crisis uh, when needed and help out in those areas. So um, he is uh, takes on a couple districts every year, and uh, I get to contact him, and he is available to take on FAMA. 
and he does have some connections since he has worked with us. So um, he has uh, presented a proposal for coaching and professional development um, related to strategic uh, communications, uh, but then also build the capacity. And one of the nice things is to uh, contract with some, uh, someone like um, Chris, is that that's the whole idea, is to build the capacity within the district that we can continue that work afterwards. So, um, you know, it's, he, he looks at a year-long plan, uh, builds capacity, and like I said, he, he works closely with districts, um, and he only takes on a few districts every year. So, um, so we do have this opportunity. Um, he uh, is focusing around standard three and standard four, which were the areas of needing improvement. And uh, just a, a few things, a strategic plan, effective messaging, uh, constituent engagement, communication within the school committee and between the committee and the superintendent, uh, internal communications within the school district, uh, media relations, uh, leveraging um, a digital toolkit, meaning um, how do you align with the website and social media, the emails, uh, online platforms, um, and use that as um, to, to help with the messaging, and then uh, crisis communication um, when that may come up. So um, just wanted to let me know that. Yeah, <laughs> so I just wanted to, I, I just wanted to let you know that um, I am moving forward um, with some support for my own professional uh, growth, um, but also across the district. So you know, I'm talking with uh, my central office team uh, and the principals. Um, everyone feels like this is a goal that we can um, all improve on, and so I would like to have that professional development for the entire team. As well, so that's um, for that uh, coaching and professional development. Great, Mike. Oh, I just wanted to know what it, what the cost of the contract like that would be. So, um, it, uh, we, the way we uh, worded it is up to um, thirty thousand. Uh, that's it. All depends on how much professional development, how many sessions, um, how many times he works on uh, communications, or is needed to work on communications through the year. Um, but we put a cap, and then here's all the things that you can do, and it's basically, at, you know, as needed. So um, we want to start out as uh, one of the days for our administrative council retreats in August for a full day. So that one, we know. From that, there may be some other professional development days for um, the staff throughout. So um, that's why it's uh, up to limit, uh, limited. Great. Um, I love the idea of including other people in this because, you know, having everyone thinking first and foremost about communication together will really have a bigger impact than if it's just only horrible one else's. And um, as one of the people that worked with Chris, he's wonderful and really, really good at what he does. And so I didn't even know he works with schools, but um, I that's fabulous <laughs> because it really, it was really remarkable helping us work through some things through the crisis and through our COVID and whatnot. And then, uh, yeah, I again. And then we we hired um, a assistant communication liaison last year, right? So, and we contract that um, okay to to help. Um, Yes, and so as we work through, she was helping, you know, just get, um, get just different things that are happening throughout the schools, but also we were bringing back, you know, or uh, recognizing different people, you know, whether it's custodians or food service, secretary, you know, so our unsung heroes within our district that all are so important to help the district work. So making those recognitions um, and talking about, you know, all the good things that are in school, I, I intend to keep her and continue to do that. And so it's really more of a publicist uh, position than it is a communication strategist. And what is her contract up to? Roughly. So you said she contracted? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I do not I, know what that offer is. It's less than 10,000. Okay. Yeah, and she, it's like the feel good stories. It's I the, know, that's fine. Yeah. Yes. It just seems like we're putting a lot of money behind marketing and public relations and press releases where I think that the communication, this is talking about marketing and press releases and, and working that way, plus TV, but I feel that that amount of money for marketing, we just said we don't have the budget for, 
you know, necessary positions doesn't make sense in that. So that's just my opinion. Uh, contracted services and staffing, mm -hmm. uh, but just refer to her. That's, uh, that's fine. But I'm just saying that that money for a contracted service could be used someplace else, maybe. So, so this is a one time contract, one year contract, and you add staffing, it's multiple years. Well, that's fine. But I'm just saying that that money could, in my opinion, could be used for something better than um, this. So that's just, you know. Okay, mm -hmm. so I um, oh, Margaret, please. Yeah, I've been to the meetings last year, and I attended two of the sessions. And um, marketing is one thing he does, but if I heard this correctly, it's not about marketing, it is about communication in terms of communicating. Uh, clearly, there have been some issues. Uh, I certainly have my trouble. You can communicate all you want, if people don't want to give you an answer, they don't think you're communicating. So, um, you know, this is about communication throughout the district with uh, obviously various members of the staff. It's not about marketing. Uh, she just said marketing. No. Yeah, she said that one thing she would do. But what, he, what I heard, and I'm like, right, she said it's about communication, you know, the family, the staff, and including them. And, 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 he, and, he, and he is outstanding. I went to children's centers. He's really hurt. He does do marketing too, but that's not what he said. He was hired. So I'd like to just say a couple things. Um, if I, uh, I, look, Dr. Dar, I appreciate you hearing the families in town and you hearing the school community members who um, were so uh, verbal on communication being paramount. Uh, there was one parent that I will continue to. Um, Quote that spam us with communication. Mm -hmm. Please tell us, how over tell us. I want to hear it time and time again um, because sometimes you just don't hear it the first, second, or third time. So um, I I appreciate that. I heard in there that there could be a, a potential for a school committee loop in on that uh, with Chris Warren. And I think that would be also amazing. Uh, I don't write emails professionally. It is not my, uh, it's not my wheelhouse. I think that I'm a better communication communicator in person. However, I've been told that I'm not as well. So um, if there's any opportunity for people to um, have help in communication, especially uh, people that are leaders and are communicating with people on a variety of levels. Uh, I think it's money well spent. I hear you, Mike, when you say that it's uh, a lot of money, but I think that you comparing um, teachers' salaries in um, a one-time cost for an an assistance to help our superintendent be the best superintendent that she can be, which is uh, what we are here to do to support, is money well spent. And um, that's what I want to say about that. So, Martha, I attended the last day of the and perceptions obviously could be very different, but I really wish that more uh, of us had been there because there was a lot of misunderstanding. It was verbalized at that meeting that in fact a lot of things that were said during the years were incorrect and um i really think that that, that was a real problem for that last month and i'm so sorry and i really wish that other other, other people here had heard what went on at that meeting i was there as well that last one yeah no you weren't not the one i knocked down oh i was yes I was there by Zoom. I oh, was oh, there. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. There were, a lot of, there were a lot of things that were said during that meeting that were untruthful. Um, and I would like to address that as well if we could on the screen time portion. I think uh, exhibits A and B, why we need a help with communication. So, uh, Dr. Gar, would you like to continue yes. on your meeting? Thank you. Can I just say one more thing about this? Are teachers included in this package that you just talked about? The communication with teachers? Because I feel that's a breakdown that we have 
there's a lot of potential with teachers and it's the thing with those meetings um a few people speak up and it, it is a representative of the whole thing i mean some teaching i don't know i just think there needs to be more sitting down um, with teachers and um, bringing them all in because they have different methods sometimes good teachers are labeled for things that other teachers do i don't know i just think we have such a great group of teachers and some you know there's just something missing in our great organization with them i don't know what it's wrong but I don't know. Part of the, the thing is the internal communication. Okay, so but that's that was where I missed that internal. Okay, great, that's great. And I'm sure that if the committee would like a detailed description of what uh, Chris Warren has to offer and uh, what we'll be paying for, I think that um, the superintendent would be happy to share that. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll certainly uh, learn more after our uh, August meeting about plan. Um, part of that is, is the work of the year. I'm very excited to say that we are going um, to have our first electric bus. So along with you know composting, um, you know, we're really trying to go, go green, but we're starting small. So we have a five-year lease and a 15 passenger electric van. Um, we are designating it as an activity bus. Um, so this will help uh, in a couple ways. Um, one, we're going to see how it works as well, but uh, for our smaller um, uh, activities and sports teams, um, since it's a 15 passenger, uh, we'll be able to use this um, uh, van and not have to contract with the scene for our smaller. So we often have to get a big bus for you know just a few students. So this will uh, help us in that way and have it uh, more available, which leaves the big bus available for other um, activities um, that we need because busing has certainly been hard for our field trips uh, and such. But anyway, um, so uh, the cost on this is uh, 30000 a year, and it's about um, four, four, six thousand to uh, 6000 more than if it was a gas power. Um, however, there are savings uh, on the other end of uh, maintenance and such. So, um, uh, and we're going to be saving on the Lucini uh, field trip. Um, Buses um, as well, contracted inside. So um, we're, we're pretty sure that this is going to come out um, ahead. Um, either way, moving forward, more green, um, you know, op option, I think is the right way to go. Um, you get a full of okay. um, Are we going to be installing the tracking station? So um, we already have, it's ready. Um, the bus will be here in August. We have the charging station here, so we can work the admin. Um, we have a, a charging station here for it. Um, yeah, that was just, yeah, yeah, I was just going to give a little more like a full okay. charge. Of eight. So, on the charge, the, the charging station we put in is a level two, and it uh, will give eight and a half hours, uh, is a full charge. Um, that you get, and uh, it's capped off as a uh, as a max speed of 65 miles per hour. So, it's already kind of logged in. I don't know how that's going to work, but we, um, yeah, it's a it's a trial. And we're hoping that you know that our group will continue to build the fleet in that in that direction. So this is good. Any other questions? What's the range? Do you know? Uh, oh, yeah, um it was 200 miles. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 We are, uh, we have periodically uh, worked with the YMCA to figure out um, some options and how can we work with them. We have a, a meeting set up um, with um, a variety of people uh, next Friday. We're going to continue to problem solve about the waiting list at um, our elementary schools, um, but also, again, looking at options uh, potentially to more and more respond. So um, we have a good schedule. Carousel Light, um, we received the uh, certificate of insurance. So that was the piece that just want to let you know that we had to follow up on, and we did receive it before they uh, opened up. Um, so um, there'll be uh, the weekends now that there'll be a, a full time student school job. And uh, bringing us the screen time. So um, I just, uh, during the uh, parent forums, we talked a lot about screen time. Um, I We still do not have a solution on how parents can uh, monitor. 
not for the lack of trying. So we're getting ready to do a presentation for you because I, what we have shared with parents, I want to make sure the school committee has heard as well. Uh, and, um, you know, in the larger uh, school community. Uh, we very much, and when I say we, all of us are uh, dedicated that if we could possibly uh, give um, parents access to be able to uh, measure or, or look at the time uh, spent on a Chromebook, I mean, we would like that as well. And, and one of the biggest reasons that I, I hope this comes across, um, I have full trust. We have full trust in our teaching staff to make those decisions about how and when um, to use technology to support and enhance instruction. Um, and because we believe in that, we believe that parents will see that, you know, the good decisions that are being made. So we are going to continue. Uh, so I'm going to, you know, kind of say that we are going to continue to look for a solution. Um, but I really want you to see uh, and uh, hear about what we've already tried. So I am going to um, queue up a presentation and I'm going to introduce um, Mark Falcone, our um, Director of Technology, and he's going to walk through what we have um, Right. So this is um this is a piece of what we went through prior to reach out to different uh, companies to find out you know if we can get screen time reports from the Chromebooks for the way that we have them set up. Um, Google, we have to reach out to Google directly. And they told us at this time it's not a method, but we'll add a feature request. Which I'm not super hopeful of because you know, these features going to make the money. Um, Google does have a product named Family Link, which is first thing you'll find if you start searching for modern screen time and Chromebooks. Um, unfortunately, that's designed for people's personal Chromebooks. You have to have the school account, the secondary account. On the device, it can't be the primary account. The way our Chromebooks work, they're only allowed to log in with the um, school account, and that's the primary account. And that allows us to have things like content filtering, our secure classroom software that lets teachers monitor the screens, um, the extensions that we push out to the devices for lots of different software. So basically, that won't work with our devices. Um, some people have mentioned the security parent or security security zone. Company is not a product, they have a lot of different products. Um, we use their security clapping product and their kind of filtering product when they're off our network. Um, the security parent portal, it's uh, if you buy that product, it lets them keep basically your web browser history. And um, it doesn't give you screen time or anything like that. But um, there's been some misinformation on that floating around social media because a teacher sent out a screenshot showing the time that a student was on different websites and people showed the printouts of, you know, from Facebook with, look, they're lying to us. This thing. Well, you know, that's the teacher portal shows those times. And I actually had a conversation with our rep from Securely Today. And um, they confirmed to me that those times are the times the tabs are open. So if you open five web browser tabs for a half an hour, it's not going to tell you that you've been on a computer for half an hour. It's all those added together. And the reason why is because that's running as an extension in the web browser. It's not running at the system level, the way the Chromebooks work. Google has access to the system level. All the other software developers have access to applications that can run as Android apps on it, your Play Store, or as web browser plugins. The way that product works is an extension on the web browser. So it can only give you what it sees through the web browser. It can't, uh, and if you're running a different program that's not web browser based, it can't give you information on that either. Um, another product uh, we looked at was called Clark. It's doing a little bit of research, kind of like they had some products out there which could give parents insight into the usage. Um, it had nothing to do with screen time. That was for 
monitoring for uh, behavioral things students are doing on it. It's actually, I know some tech directors in other districts that use that product. It um, is more to look for um, kids that are like emailing or sending chats to their friends about maybe self harm, things like that, to uh, give alerts to parents or school administrators. It's more of a safety thing. Um, Go Guardian, it's another company they make pretty much identical products to security. Um, they do the same thing. Um, there's a bunch of other software. I've talked to so many software companies, and none of them have been able to be. Um, it says other oh, Massachusetts school district. Um, I'm a member of a couple of listservs with uh, tech directors throughout the state. And funny thing is, when I first reached out, most of them responded back, why do you even get involved? That, that's a parenting issue. That's a teaching issue. I said, oh, no, that's, that's an issue. And, and luckily, uh, one of the uh, tech directors from another local school that used to work in Falmouth, who was a great teacher when she was here, uh, she kind of stuck up for me. She goes, oh, it's a culture thing. I understand. And she, uh, <laughs> she gave me some suggestions, but nothing that could really help us out. So, um, all these have been roadblocks for us. The, the one way we were able to find somewhat of a screen time for it is there's, um, there's an open source uh, script out there called Gamus. Google, can't remember what it stands for at this point in time, we're a little tired, but um, that's actually not provided by Google, but it uh, accesses some of the, the Google APIs, kind of the back end of the Google framework. So if you're using your super admin account, you can run these scripts that pull different pieces of information out of the back end of the Google admin. It's not available normally through Google. And um, one of those reports that you can run with it is called a cross activity report which you run that and it gives you hundreds of thousands of lines in a spreadsheet where it basically lists the device name and like all the information it has about the time that that device was on. So it might say this device on this day, 20 minutes. <laughs> and that's from the time it was logged in until the lid was closed, it was locked out. And um, so basically for one student, if you look it up by the device name, it might have this many if they use a lot or this many. And it's to basically get that information into someone's hands. If you're looking for more than like a couple pieces of information off of it, it would take hours. And I would have brought one of those to print out, except it's obviously we're putting this on TV and it's all personal identifying information on students. That's how we're able to we'd be able to find out information from that. I mean to have someone go through that report just once to get that information for you know, even 20 students, it would take two days. So it's really not a viable option. I went through it, it took me a couple hours to get um, averages for different schools of about a month or two back. Um, well, this is mentioning internet sites first time. This was, I mentioned earlier that, you know, if you have four sites open for 30 minutes, it's not gonna tell you 30 minutes of screen time. It's, you know, gotta say they were two hours of those internet sites. Um, I think I think I mentioned everything you just already. Oh, really? Get the next day. <laughs> Now, the interesting thing is the security software. We originally got it um, when schools were going remote for COVID. And uh, we kept it because a lot of teachers love it. A lot of them love it. You know, they can look at their screen and see all the kids in the class, what they're doing. They can actually um, create, you know, custom website block lists for within their own class. Like if there's, um, it is sites that your kids are going to your class that aren't blocked district wide, but maybe they're distracting for your kids. The teachers can set up a custom block list. They can push their website up the entire class. So there's a lot of features within that program that teachers love. Um, some teachers don't like to use it because they like to walk around and see what the kids are doing and you know have that personal connection with the students. Um, I think it all depends on a different class and how you teach a class in grade level. Um, and this is that uh, app control and content filtering. Um, when you're on a device within our school network here, 
it's going through a piece of hardware it's called a firewall that has a lot of other things running on it. Um, one's called App Control, which it basically looks at the traffic going through to the internet and tries to determine what type of application that is. And I forget the number of unique applications signature it has on it. Something between three and four thousand. And basically, with that app control, um, we can put on, like, for instance, VPN apps. And uh, 30 will come up, we just block VPN apps. And it's going to block that based on the way the traffic looks. Uh, we also have content filtering, which has categories of um, data, which is either blocked or not blocked based on the category. And then we can um, add allow and uh, deny this on top of that. So if it's there's a website that's in a block category, but it's actually an educational category, we can allow that through and vice versa, we can block things. Um, once you get off our school network, we don't have that physical piece of hardware things go through, but that's where we're using the uh, securely content filtering, which is not robust, but we just have some categories to block. We have there's less total categories, but it's more, you know, kind of block the most harmful things. Go to the next slide. Sure. Yeah. Um, these are the block content and allowed content. Um, I think there's a few more in the allowed, but basically we're blocking violence, hate, racism, weapons, drugs, alcohol, pornography, gadgets, uh, messaging, and games, social networking. And that games one, that's a perfect example where it's Years ago, we decided to block that. Um, gotten close to 20 years ago, just through the bandwidth. But uh, teachers really like us to keep blocking because it keeps the kids on track. But there's a lot of educational games. So a lot of times, the teacher will say, Can we get this unblocked? And that's where we have the allow list to override a particular category block. And then there's some examples the allow content, obviously. Arts, entertainment, business, economy, government, military, uh, anything that might be educational. This is um, the off school list. Instead of having you know, 15 or 59 or the exact number of categories that we block them out, there's only about 10 categories. So we're blocking pornography, drugs, gambling, other adult content, network misuse of hate. So that's what the device is trying to block when your Chrome goes falling into your arrow. All right, so cell phone use in school. Uh, Mary, which is principal at high school, would once a year come here. Some kids are using their cell phones. Once a year. <laughs> no, Mary, it's a little And so, uh, yeah, that, that CC is really important that there's huge content. I mean, you go out there and buy a device and do it. <laughs> They're about this big. They're really cheap to make. Um, you can get in a lot of legal trouble for selling that device, for buying that device. Um, if the school were going to put one in the school, schools could get in a lot of trouble. I uh, last year, a guy in New Jersey got fined $48,000 for having one of his problems driving to work because he was worried about. Yeah, you know, other people talking on cell phones. Um, businesses are routinely getting fined in the hundreds of thousands of dollars from softies. Um, the other thing is, is um, and it's part of the reason why it's very illegal to block those, it's a public safety issue. You're blocking a cell phone, someone can't call 911. Um, and that's something that with the um, some of the school safety initiatives we have going on right now, one of the problems we found is that at the high school, by the way, the building's built. And it's uh, very hard for cell phone frequencies to penetrate the parts of the building. And I know over the past couple of years, the district has been looking into ways to actually improve the cell phone signal to the schools for the safety feature. Um, unfortunately, let's kids use the devices for things they probably shouldn't, but I don't know a good solution for that. Um, sorry. Anyone have any questions, comments? Okay. Right. Thank you. Um, the other day at the family forum, someone said that you can't get any of the block sites using a school computer on a school network. 
Okay, Mike. But I was there this this morning for field day. It was a fantastic field day in North Falmouth. And within two minutes, I could get on Twitter, Reddit. That's in the open from And how are you doing that? Using a student, a third grader's laptop. You just went to the website and went to it? What's that? You just went to the website and went to it? I opened it up. It shows where Google Classroom and the URL. I typed twitter.com, pops right up. And the URL, I typed reddit.com. I don't right think, up. no, Twitter and Reddit, I don't think are for Okay, but those are social media yeah. averaging platforms. Um, we unlocked Twitter a few years ago because some of the high school teachers were using it in oh. social science course. And then I, I did notice that, and then, like I said, we have those categories, but then we do have some allowed blocks that override yeah. some of those categories. And then again, using this, the third graders' laptop at North Falmouth with their network, it's you can't do an incognito tab that's been grayed out. Yeah. But it is very easy to go to a secondary search website where you can find gambling yeah. site, uh, adult content, violence. Uh, you can get into YouTube. Um, do you know what not block anyway? Well, this is what I'm saying that students, and if there's an age filter, students can then log into an adult's account. Kids are smart these days. If you give a, a student laptop on a school network to a fifth, sixth, seventh grade kid, um, they'll do illegal activities. You can get onto illegal movie streaming sites that one, two, three movies is blocked. Um, but when you Google something like that, it gives you a dozen other options. And kids have nothing but time to go through. So I I think I'm saying this because these are not as protected as people think they are. It is very easy. And also these these kids, a fifth grade kid knows more about technology than most adults. And they're gonna find a way to get around this. I'm bringing this up because I I watched that that last parents meeting and I wanted to first thank the parents for coming out over and over again um, and speaking. But the larger issue is that the parents who don't want their students on these computers, there was discussion of, oh, that can't happen at school, but it can happen at school. I know the mother you're talking about, her, her son got in trouble for watching a legal movie during school. Um, and then you have other people blaming, oh, that's bad parenting. It's not bad parenting, or maybe they brought in a mobile device or a hotspot. That's not the case. These kids are smart with a school computer and a school web, a school network. They can get around to firewalls. I got around in less than two minutes, and I'm not as smart as the fifth grade. I hope you're doing your best effort. Okay, but my point is that you cannot, and, and administration cannot tell the parents that nothing bad can happen at the school. It can happen at home, whatnot. That's not true. You can take a third grade computer on a school network. And this is what these parents who've been talking for six, seven, eight months have been talking about. They don't want the laptop home. They don't want their kids in the laptops. There are several reasons beyond screen time. There's no way to monitor what they're doing, what sites they're on. There's firewalls and those kinds of things. Kids are smart. Um, and I, I can get around it, kids can get around it. So just so everyone knows that they're not super secure. But thank you. Thank you. Any yeah, I could have done before, but I've never heard that discussion. I've heard about screen time, but I've never heard about kids learning to read those sites. But I've been on the tech committee, and the tech committee members tell me, and it's been a concern that if kids get on sites like that, the computers are taken away. Okay, so, so anyone, anyone wants to, you want your students' computer taken away, you don't legal sites, and the teachers will take them away? That's kind of me. We also have. Teachers are in a classroom teaching, they're trying to watch what's going on. I understand. Like you mentioned, that parent where the kid was watching movies in the class. Yeah. And it was found out because the teachers are paying attention to these. I understand that. That's great. The teacher did that, but it just seems okay. to be. Okay. I'm sorry. Sure. I, I just wanted to say, um, you know, thank you for sharing this information. And but it seems like you spent a lot of time trying to figure out a way to make it happen. And I appreciate the effort, even though um, you know, it's just not, it's just not possible. Um, I didn't have a question. I just wanted to say thanks for, for trying. So um, I, I just have a couple of questions. It seems as though Google is bridling us. So my question is, when is our contract up with Google Chromebook? 
and then switching to an Apple device where it's known that there's more control, is that an option? And if you cannot answer me right this moment, that is perfectly fine. But I just, from my perspective, and I did my own research months ago when this came up, and I came up with, you know, certainly not the search that you did, but essentially the same result that there, there are not a lot of uh, guardrails around the Google Chromebook. And I, I understand that Google makes their money on on network chatter, on website trafficking. So they're not, it's not in Google's interest to save how long you've been on the internet or online or having screen time because they want you to keep going. That's that's how Google makes their money. Um, I'm sure that that wasn't their intent when they put together cheap laptops and I that's not a, a slap to uh, our schools that we're buying. I don't mean it like that. I just mean it that like they're mass producing these laptops for students, for kids to use and they're, um, well, I'd like to say they're both but they're not because the keys fall off. But anyway, I'm wondering, perhaps switching to another uh, product is warranted where we know that we can have more control because as I said at another family forum, I had more control over my um, first iPhone from, I don't know, 10 years ago than I have over the Google Chromebook. So perhaps switching devices is warranted. So we can do nothing that's impossible. Uh, there is a cost involved. Sure. Um, an Apple product is certainly um, more expensive than the, the Google um, product. But we can certainly put something together and bring it back to you so you can actually have, have it. I think that that would be great for, um, especially where there are, you know, when we got the Chromebooks, it was long before COVID and it was really supposed to just be on a cart and they weren't coming home. And then with, with COVID, a lot of, uh, Horses left the barn and it's hard to bring them back in, but maybe we just need to um, move away from the barn and horses and go to something else. Um, and that, that's what I mean by switching from Apple, from Google to perhaps Apple. Maybe Apple isn't the product, but um, I think it's warranted and I appreciate you looking into that. Heather? Um, a clarifying question. I heard you say you near know, the beginning of your presentation that it's not possible to get the information parents want about screen time with the devices as they're currently configured. Correct. Right. So is there essentially a choice between being able with, with these devices, um, if these are the devices, a choice between having the controls we currently have around content, if we relax those, will we be able to get the information parents want about use? Is, is that kind of the, the no, no. The guy is stuff that I mean, Chromebooks wouldn't work if we were going to step them up and wait for that thing and software to work. What? <clears throat> Sorry, for you, forgive me, but being a teacher, one time I know I had to write lesson plans. And in my lesson plans, you have your introduction time, you have your time you're going to do this, your time you're going to do that. We know, like, ST map, I don't know how you, it's not even how you say that. What's the name? ST map, I don't know street map, so I can say it. But I mean, street map, street map has a certain amount of time allotted to them. Can't we give, like, the let the lesson plan amount of time for these devices isn't that close enough? I mean, wouldn't that answer some of the parents? So I feel like I just want to say that not every kid can learn in that lesson time. Of course, you have variances, but I mean, there must be a way <clears throat> you gauge what you do during the classes. I mean, it's not going to be one hundred percent accurate. Nor are these mechanical things we put on the animals and accurate. I mean, it's, this is not the place to make all these decisions at this time of night and all these things, but I think we've got a dedicated sit down with the actual other ways to work on like this. Um, can we look at what's starting from the 
Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. My bad. Well, I do think that from what I've heard and I listen to many of the teachers, they, they use technology as a starting point to begin the lesson. Okay, but let's not go into that just a second now. I just think we need to have an overall look at different possibilities. We'll put it on the request of information and we'll go right. Okay, and just to wrap up, uh, my second, I'm going to turn it over to Henry. Um, Shares of information. Yes. So um, just going back to our equity discussion, and we were just saying we just want teachers to love students and you know each other. So uh, I think it's important to always look at the diversity of students and their families. And uh, so the the the, uh, the updates I have is for um, the, the date that we have coming up. So the first one is Pride Month. Uh, Pride Month's the annual uh, celebration. Uh, it was first, um, you know, abided by uh, a dark part of our U.S. history where we had the uh, Stonewall Riots in 1969. It's always amazed me that I was still alive. I was I was alive when this happened, and there are people in this community in Falmouth that actually were at Stonewall uh, riots and. You know, they would love to share that kind of situation. I mean, that's getting in there and saying, bye. Wow, I can't believe that you were there. Um, but, uh, you know, Clinton started it with the Pride Month, and I hope that our community uh, looks at our diversity of our community, that we have lots of different people. And uh, so I want to just recognize uh, the LGBTQ plus community and say, I have Pride Month. Uh, the next one, Caribbean and uh, the Caribbean American Heritage Month, uh, not too many Haitians background me, but uh, we have a rich, uh, we have a rich um, uh, Jamaican population and others. So it's very important to see that our families are diverse and they have contributions. Uh, definitely millions of people, but in our town, we definitely have many people that contribute to the uh, the richness of our community. And so, uh, want to recognize that June is also that month. Uh, the new uh, the new, the brand new um, um, festival that we have is Juneteenth. Uh, I, I love that our schools are really taking, uh, they're, they're, they're really engaging on this. So in, this is used to be a Texas uh, holiday in June 7th, in, in, um, in June 19, 1865, two months after the end of the Civil War. Uh, the, Black slaves were released in Texas, and that became a big holiday in Texas. And I love that the nation has taken this because I think the the role of restoration, role of going out in each community, saying, "Be free, Be, you're one of us, you are, um, you're, you're American." I think that that, that role continues. And so uh, we've been doing some stuff on that. I, I would I would love to see. I don't know if we have this, but on the Fifth, on the 15th, this Thursday, we have a flyer. I don't think we have that. It's not one of my flyers I have. But the, there's a beloved community. No, not one of those. Not one of those. There's a beloved community, uh, and we're going to dig in on we're going to dig in on Juneteenth. There's a story on Juneteenth, and uh, there's going to be a, uh, an evaluation. Families, parents are going to evaluate how well do we, how well are we, um, we. We appreciate diversity. I think that's the call for that form. So that's this Thursday. Uh, next, the next part, and I know it's in there, is our community uh, June, Juneteenth flyer, which is on Saturday. The actual date of Juneteenth is the 19th, but the community says on the 17th at, five, at the 10 o'clock in the morning, we're going to have a reenactment, um, Representative Bear is going to be there. I just to say that's a supposed to be surprised. I'm not sure, but he's going to be a reactant. Reactant um, is going to be a lot of students' involvement. Uh, there'll be poster, there's going to be a poster uh, reveal of the best posters. I'm um, just letting you know that it's already out. So uh, there'll be kids singing as well. But Juneteenth is a celebration. I, I would love to. Okay. I would love that. Um, yeah, these are the kids and these are the winners and we'll be displaying the winners of the GT poster that we have here but I, I feel like we need to have that spirit of bringing people together restoring um ills 
And uh, that's an important thing that I love about Juneteenth. On the one of the one of the things in there is a handout on Juneteenth, and uh, basically not only we're going to celebrate, but we have to educate. So, <laughs> sorry, so, no, 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 this is really good. Uh, I'll put it out here so you guys can look at it as well. But um, there's a handout, Juneteenth handout, handout, so that parents can not only see and celebrate, but they can learn. And that's one of the handouts you have. Uh, the act there on the 19th, uh, the uh, Woods Hole Diversity Advisory uh, Committee committee has had their own on the 19th, a known celebration. So that's the fine, that's a real nice one that you're holding, Michael. That one right there, yeah, that's a that's a nice uh display. So all of these are in there, and these are all community members that are going off and doing well. So that uh was sent to me by Sarah Moore. The handout was um, created by community member Charles Evans, and uh, the flyer was the fly. The first fly that sent out was from Pamela. Oh my goodness, Pamela! I forget your name. Was it? Pamela. Sorry, Pamela, if you're listening. Uh, the the uh, last name escaped me, but uh, these are all community members are saying we want to be part and joining us with this celebration. So I hope the whole community can say. Let's celebrate. Let's uh, appreciate diversity. Let's look at families and say thank you for making our community real rich. And I like to end with, if you don't mind, with uh, you know we've talked about this fair, but there's one thing talking about. There's another thing actually to see the fair. Uh, this multicultural fair that happened on May the 20th was so fabulous, fantastic. But um, I was so glad that someone created a created something, well, now it's, um, I have to make sure I know what I'm doing here. My, there it is, okay, so, all right, the, here, go on. Yeah, go there. Oh, how do I let go? <laughs> yes, uh, do not come near me, Ryan. <laughs> Do not put anywhere near me. All right.
awesome is that I, I think what's really awesome is the community members that kind of show they're like, I want to show you who I am. I really want to, this is who I am. And you can see in their faces, you got the kid, the, the community member, this is who I am. And I feel like that's the, the awesomeness of um, Heritage Month and Remembrance. You're saying, this is who I am. Let's celebrate who I am. And that's why I want, um, you know, staff loving students because they are showing you who you are. And so I hope you guys can celebrate with me this this month and we'll talk about others. Yes. Could I just verify? I had the long date. I thought the thing in the library was on Monday, but it's Saturday. So the which one? This the the Juneteenth the Saturday. Juneteenth at the lawn is on Saturday morning. Ten o'clock. Right? Ten o'clock is on Saturday, and Monday is the actual Juneteenth. Schools are off, and and uh, the DAC, the the verse comes for having something on nineteenth. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, routine business. I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes of May 23rd, 2023. Is there a second? I was going to one jump in if I could. I just, I'm sorry. First, we're just going to do the second, okay. and then we're going to do the discussion. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I think that Jacqueline McMurray's name is spelled incorrectly. I believe it's MC, but just a small thing. Uh, on the public. MC, and her first name is also spelled incorrectly. <laughs> Well, if you're going in correct names, I saw my wrong <laughs> But I'll, I'll go offline and share with you. Yeah, I'll fix Cheryl. I'll get that. Uh, Miss McBurn's name. Any other edits? I don't know if it needs to be on the record, but there was um, somewhere where the new, newly elected committee members um, were welcomed. I think I, that. I technically was a newly elected member too, so I don't know if you should say Harry Lewis was also newly elected. I don't know if you need that for the record. Well, welcome, Terry. Well, I think they were So if you don't welcome, so you could be in there. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's, I don't care about it. I don't know if you can have We can fix that. Any other edits? A couple of typos. Sure. Uh, Discipline has actually written as the cycle a couple of places. Uh, in the second public comment, uh, the third line uh, is the cycle instead of discipline, and then uh, it's act on a student disciple policy. Um, Where was the disciple policy? If you'll keep going down, that one's actually in bold. It's under the. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, nice. Okay. Well, that's what happens. You type it once and then it remembers to what you're saying. Okay. Thank you. Any other edits? Okay, there's been a motion. There's a second with edits. All in favor? Any, any opposed? Any abstention? All right. Great. Exactly. Committee member, excuse me, committee member reports. Who would like to go? Oh, Barry. I know we have a long time to dance about the kids from Vips this time. Just cool. news. Um, this month's students of the month were the Oscar Scholarship uh, Award winners, and that was Joe Simpkins and Richard Rodwood Any other Margaret? The Rodwood report. Uh, they talked about the successes, the challenges, and surprises this year. They talked about their goals and where they close with recruit, recruit, recruitment. And they're looking for people that are not tech savvy since I am leaving them. They want another <laughs> duck. <laughs> nice. Okay. Um, they, they talked about what they wanted to accomplish. They're going to change their design to uh, have their letters match the clicking sign. Um, they also want to talk about their action and their evidence of their progress. And at the end, there was a, a discussion, and a couple, of, a couple of teachers felt that they were being targeted by parents and were very upset about that. Um, 
And actually, uh, one of the things that Henry heard there, so if I get it wrong, you can correct me. Uh, one of the teachers have said that uh, in the high school, one of their students said, I'm very concerned about my younger siblings, that they will not have an opportunity to have technology if this kind of stuff goes on. So I thought that was important. The same level. Like the same level, level. they would have when they were, when they were at that age. Okay, and now, and is there anything about technology? That was it? No, that was it. Okay, the Learning Access Advisory Committee, uh, the successes, I think I'll just name them, increase uh, ELD staff at the high school 1 to 1 to 0.5, which will provide them with two classes at each time, so they felt very good about that. Uh, the start of EL peer mentoring program at the high school, the increased communication with families through the LPAT, um, one of the things I think was really exciting is there was a multilingual student who's returning to found as a police officer. I thought that was very um, um, specific. On the Osprey study, there's going to be an American <laughs> volunteer help with that. Uh, there's clarity about the ISP, IST progress and how to support PBOs. Uh, creation of a family liaison, liaison job description, even if we can't do it. Um, someday. Someday, no. yeah. You know, SCI, SCI professional learning community and professional development. And the continuing challenges for the year is how do we find ways of telling our stories and sharing our successes? And that you added videos, which is one of my uh, recommendations. That, People don't really watch it because they were little videos that would be so much more helpful. Okay. Thank you, Margaret. Anyone else? Oh, I had a couple things. Sure. Um, so the voter registration drive for the seniors um, was super fun. I had a great time. It was set up differently. So thank you to the high school for having us um, at that. For exactly how many people registered because it's all digital now. We don't do we used to do the old paper forms and you have to fill them out and collect them. That's not that. That's not how it gets full. So um, it was all digital with QR codes so they can register. Um, the second thing was that uh, I had the chance to go to the Lawrence School Town meeting on Monday, which was so impressive. Um, they modeled the, our representative form of government and um, there weren't articles this year were on beautification of the school, which included outdoor plantings and indoor murals. Um, they, of course, wanted to talk about expanding the uniform, which is no great surprise, and uh, purchasing sporting equipment, and all um, three of their articles passed um, overwhelmingly, I would say. Um, but it was just, it was a, it was the perfect model of how government should be working. They debated, and they had questions, and they were kind and thoughtful, and it was very, very impressive. Um, and then the last thing is that um, the vice chair for the last few years has been responsible for coordinating the retreat. So Melissa and I have been talking about a couple um, pieces of it, and I'm going to send out a Google an email that has a link to a little form. If you can click on that and fill it out um, before the end of the week, so we can get it scheduled. Having all of us. You know, there's so many of us. So trying to find a date is going to be no small task. But it'll be about your availability um, over the summer for retreat and also um, talks. And I jotted down what we already talked about, but um, there'll be some specific topics if you can rank and which ones are you think would be the most useful. So that's coming. I had it on my list to ask you about that. Um, so you want input about what? Um, Topics we would like to discuss. Yeah, so this form had a little spot where you can just stop it. Okay, yeah, and I was going to say if we could get to, um, to me, it's hard to round up nine people plus four, ten people to keep could have vacations because I would really like to have um, some guidance from MASC and our procedural um, things like we had um, evaluation, we could use some guidance on that. Um, um, Dorothy. Um, Presta. Presta. Um, slave. You know, she gives videos, and so it isn't just our district that has trouble with those evaluation forms. But I mean, if we're going to get her to come, I know Jim Hardy is our team, so, our field thing. But Dorothy had does. I saw her videos on on doing evaluations, and 
we could also ask her for like when we run our meetings, do we need to say a motion or a second or can be a roll call? So just some procedural things. So um, so I've already talked to Tim Hardy uh, about his availability because Melissa and I agree that we really could use some. I mean, that's what they do. They're very yeah, good about that it. it. Um, and so some of the topics that you'll see listed are things that is their specialty for coming in and doing it. But if you can make sure that you put those in because it, the form is just going to dump it all into one document so that it'll be easy for us to figure out which I need is not a Google Docs. It's not a doc, it's a form. Oh, you know what I'm saying. Can we get help with those? <laughs> if you need it, you know I'm not sure. No, I am not. I have total faith in you, but you can call me. <laughs> Any other committee member reports? So I just want to say that I have the uh, distinct honor of handing out uh, diplomas at graduation. And uh, I know that you've all heard me say this before, but handing out graduation diplomas in the field house that I graduated from to students who are children of my friends was a huge emotional lift. And I, um, I do take this role seriously. I take my position here on school committee seriously. And when I say that I am here for the parents that want to be here and can't, and uh, I mean it. And um, I, I thank you again for not unanimously, but electing me as chair. And I promise to do my very best. Um, and I would just like to also say congratulations to all the graduates, and you are still forever up to her. And um, moving forward, I think that things that matter to me that I've heard repeatedly for the last few months uh, here tonight, relationships and communications matter. So um, I would sort of like to have that as our theme, thinking forward. Um, I'd like to also think that I am, and uh, the door is always open if you want to talk to me, if you have questions, I like to consider myself somebody that is easy to talk to. So please, any questions, if there's anything I can help with, if there's something that's brewing, don't feel like you have to wait, please reach out. So um, that being said, the next thing on the agenda says request for information. We used to have future agenda items also on there. So I think moving forward, I'd like to make it sort of a slash thing. So request for information slash future agenda items. And Terry, I do have your tech screen devices all encompassing. Uh, if, are there any other requests for information or future agenda items soon? Um, not necessarily for a meeting, but um, since I was last on the school committee, um, the people signing on the bills has been reduced. Um, I personally always felt that it was a great check, check and balance in regards to keeping us informed as to what was going on with the um, budget and the paying of bills. With that being said, um, now that it's down to one or two people for bill signing, I would appreciate a monthly financial report included in our um, packet at some point, just so we're all able to keep up to date with the goings on in the budget. I like it. Thank you. Anyone else, Mike? Um, I know we discussed this months ago, but exit interviews. I know that there's a, a lot of teachers who are retiring and um, or, or, or staff who's retiring or leaving whatnot. Can we get exit interviews? I don't know. I don't know the legality of this, Mary. Can they be redacted? Can we have like a chart? Just to get some idea of what, like, you know, hearing from people as they, as they leave, wherever they might go, is that something that we can do? To I think you'd have to get their consent that even if redacted, that's released, because even when things are redacted, there's still identifying information in there if they didn't want to be identified. Okay, so with their consent. And then can we get a tally of how many of the staff, teachers, retiring, leaving, have actually sat down for an exit interview, even if we don't get them, just to get a number, a percentage of those who, who left and how many we talked to. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Some nitpicky questions, sir. Um, 
there was a, an email about binders. Will yes. the numbers, when, when should we expect to get binders? This is ready. Uh, hopefully by the time you're retreating, which would be in August, is that correct? In August, we'll have it. We should get them done by month. You can, um, and if you'd like, you can then tell us if you're welcome to it. Mm -hmm. Margaret, and then if I could say one more thing. Um, that we uh, developed the form last year that we use to put more of the information. Are you going to use that form? No, I would like to, excellent question, Margaret. Thank you for asking. I um I might kind of change things up a bit, do uh, what we had done in years past. I think it's really important for the people who elect us in these positions to see what we're asking for. Um okay. to, so that there if if it's something, you know, when you ask somebody to ask for something on your behalf. You kind of want to make sure that that question was asked as opposed to, um, yeah, I did it. I, I did it and they said no. And so I think that um, I would like to bring that uh, into light again. I think it, it's just, um, it's a different style. And uh, that's my thought on that. Thank you. You're welcome. If I may. Um, $645,000 in local scholarships um, is an amazing amount. <laughs> uh, and I would really like to enlist the aid of Gilda. I think she's already left, but um, for the people of the enterprise in regards to publishing, who received what um, in the newspaper. It gives our community an opportunity to honor these kids. They great job. And um, as well, it also honors the foundations and individuals and corporations, et cetera, that contributed to the cause. So if we can get any help from the enterprise, that'd be wonderful. Thank you. It's overwhelming. Yeah, it really is. Can I just say a couple right. more sentences? Yes. About this graduation talk. I heard Chick say um, it was a wonderful ceremony. I haven't gone through many of those. And Mary, you know, too. The Student Activities um, Office, and that would be Amy McKenzie and Hart. Um, the guidance department has to double check those names and everything. I know Paul Kale double checks the name. And the custodians who move all those chairs and all that. There's a lot of behind the scenes work that I think people should you're just mentioning, which I just did. Oh, and I just want to say one more thing about graduation. Um, I think that the students made the right call to bring it inside because I did see some pictures online of friends whose graduations were outside uh, and it was so I just want to give credit for credits due to the students who uh, decided on their own behalf to bring it inside. I know it's a drive, it's not to do it outside, but it's not fun when it's for us. Any other requests for information or future agenda items? Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Mike, second. Are there all in favor? Any abstainment?